He only ruled for six and a half years. And about 10 years after he died, Basil II redefined what it meant to be a great emperor. Yet, Nicephorus II Phocas is still one of the best known rulers of the Byzantine world and one of its most important. Many of his achievements, however, came before he assumed the purple. In this video, I want to go through all of the various events of Nicephorus's career in great detail. We'll look at the white death of the Saracen and also all of the various controversies that surround his life and legacy. So before we delve any deeper, I would like to first lay out what those controversies are. As for our guiding concerns, the first thing that springs to mind for me is that right now there is something of a trend where people are trying to claim figures like John Kirkawas and Nicephorus II Phocas as proto-crusaders, as people who fought to extend the reach of the Christian faith, and as people who more or less were crusaders before crusading was an actual thing. So in this video, we'll look at the question of whether he is in fact a proto-crusader or whether he is more of a traditional soldier emperor who happened to be more pious than average. There is evidence for both of those positions. Personally, I fall on the side that he was more of a soldier emperor who just happened to be more pious, but I think that there's enough evidence out there you can make a pretty reasonable case either way. Another thing that I'd like to discuss is what were Nicephorus's long-term goals. Um, he died by assassination, for those of you who don't know. So we don't really know what he was planning in the long run, and that has a lot of bearing on the previous question as to whether or not he is a proto-crusader. Um, so we'll talk about what he was planning and try to get sort of a sense of how he operated. Another thing that we need to be aware of throughout is that all of the sources on Nicephorus are heavily biased to the point of creating distortion, and it is worth considering the nature of the biases of our major sources. So let's go ahead and look at some of our major sources and discuss some of the biases that help to shape those narratives. One of the reasons why it's taken me so long to really form a coherent video on Nicephorus is because of this extraordinary amount of source bias, which is the worst I've encountered so far in this series. Our surviving sources on Nicephorus tend to either loud or loathe him. He was lauded for his military victories, but hated for his domestic policies. And you have to remember, Byzantine aristocrats are responsible for writing most of the sources that we have, and they would have been the most affected by his domestic policies, so you can guess how they felt about his tax policies. Leo the Deacon is one major source. He has an interesting account, but often Nicephorus appears excessively bellicose and aggressive in ways that would probably not result in success were they accurate. At one point, he has Nicephorus starting a war against Bulgaria just out of the blue because an envoy pissed him off and then he just took his army out and immediately started laying waste, supposedly captured dozens of border forts, none of which are named. So Leo's account can be a little iffy at times. There's also John Skylitzes. He wrote in the 11th century, so he is a bit later, meaning that he was not a contemporary to any of the events that he's describing. However, his accounts of things are often more plausible. So then we're left with the choice of do we go with the person who's more contemporary or the person who makes more sense. In this case, I think that it's probably best to follow Skylitzes more than Leo. There's also Lutprand of Cremona. He is a famous ambassador who visited Constantinople twice, once when Constantine VII was on the throne and again during the time of Nicephorus. He had a very negative um, impression of Nicephorus and his brother Leo because uh, they did not receive him kindly. But as we'll see, there were reasons why Nicephorus and Leo may have been snippy, and also Lutprand had a vested interest in trying to paint them as darkly as possible because his embassy failed and he wanted to explain exactly why that wasn't his fault. We also have an impression of Nicephorus by Abu Faras. He is a cousin of Saif and a poet. He was captive at Constantinople for a while, but despite being a prisoner of war, he actually met Nicephorus 
and formed a pretty positive impression of him. And in fact, it seems like a lot of our foreign sources are more favorable to Nicephorus's person than the domestic ones, with the obvious exception of Lutprand of Cremona out of Italy. So um, we don't really have a very accurate picture of what Nicephorus was like as a person, but it, we, I think we can come to some conclusions based on what happened. But the key thing to take away here is that if you decide to do more research on Nicephorus II and Phocas, you really need to think a lot about what kind of narrative these sources are trying to push because all of them have an agenda and that agenda is not really in line with what you might think of as objective truth or simple fact-telling. Nicephorus was born in 912 and he was named for his grandfather who had been a legendary general just a few years prior, mostly in South Italy, stemming the tide of the Islamic advance which had captured Sicily. The Focades were perhaps Rome's best known military aristocratic family. There were several families which produced general after general, but none of them were quite as well placed as the Focades. That implies heavily, at least in my mind, that the Focas family had probably more wealth than your average military aristocratic clan. Um, Nicephorus had an uncle named Leo Focas the Elder, and he was famous mostly for being a bad general fighting the Bulgarians and then later competing for the throne. He tried to vie for the hand of Zoe Carbonopsina, the mother of Constantine the Seventh, but ultimately he lost in a succession struggle against Romanus the First Lycopinus in 920, and he lost his life. Now, it appears that Romanus did not actually intend to kill Leo, but that's how things turned out, and this meant that Nicephorus's father, Bardos, then became the new head of the family, and he would remain so for a very long time. Bardos was, of course, bitter about the power struggle that had ended his brother's life, and he was never really a supporter of Romanus I, although the two did reconcile, at least in theory. Bardos would continue to hold some power and some positions, but he was more or less on the sidelines. Secretly, Bardos was always hoping to help Constantine VII reclaim his throne and throw out the Lycopony. That would finally happen in 944 to 945. Nicephorus also had a younger brother, also named Leo, who would be a lifelong ally and supporter. And as I've argued elsewhere, Leo was arguably as good or better as a general when compared with Nicephorus which is saying quite a bit if you know Nicephorus's reputation at all. Uh, Nicephorus also had a nephew named John Zemiskis who was only about 10 to 15 years younger. And because he would come of age early and be a loyal general for a long period of time, he would also play a pivotal role. For those of you who knows how Nicephorus's life ends, you also know that Zemiskis remains prominent, although somewhat less useful during that later period. Nicephorus was born around 912 CE. During the time of his youth, the Phocas family was largely on the sidelines because Romanus I was in power and he suspected the Phocades of disloyalty, so he didn't want to give any members of the family major commands. That being said, the family was never completely out of power. Bardos would serve as Stratagos on a number of occasions during that period. Nicephorus and his brother Leo, as well as their other brother Constantine, I presume, dedicated themselves to learning and mastering the art of war. As members of the military aristocracy, this was what they did with their time. When Constantine VII was restored in 945, Bardos was one of his key supporters, and Constantine decided to reward Bardos and to symbolically undo what Romanus had wrought. And one way to do that was to empower Bardos and the Focades by giving them a high command in the east. Bardos was given the most important military command in the entire Byzantine world, the office of Domesticus of the East. This meant that he was the commander in chief of all of the eastern armies and themes. At the time, Byzantium was expanding eastward against Cilicia and 
other areas. So this meant that Bardos would have a great opportunity to gain glory and also to do good service for the empire. Nicephorus, Leo, and John Zemiskis were all dealt in and would serve as strategoi under Bardos. Because Zemiskis was a little younger, he probably didn't join until a little later, but by 955 or so, he was definitely already there. Nicephorus, for his part, would start out as the strategos of Anatolicon, one of the strongest themes in the empire. Things went well for the first several years, however, Bardos would suffer defeats at the hands of Saif al-Dala, the emir of Aleppo, in 952, 953, and 954. During one of these confrontations, he was severely wounded and was barely able to recover. In one battle in 953 at Germanicaea, Nicephorus' brother Constantine, who was fighting alongside of Bardos, was captured and later died in captivity. Depending on which source you read, he either died of natural causes, so say the Arabs, or he died due to neglect and abuse, so say the Christians. Obviously, the truth is unknowable, but given how valuable he would be as someone you could get ransom for, I think that in this case, the Arab account makes more sense. In 954 to 955, Bardos retired as Domesticus, by this time already being about 80 years old, perhaps 75 to 80 years old. So Bardas had a good long run, but ultimately he proved to be incapable of dealing with Saif al-Dallah. Just to give some context, earlier before um, Constantine VII came back to power, the general in the east had been John Kirkawas, who had been able to hold his own against Saif. But Bardas clearly was a little too old to do that. So now, who would take the place of Bardos as Domesticus of the East. Constantine VII was still duly grateful to the Focades for their dedicated service and their support during his time of virtual captivity. Therefore, he confirmed Nicephorus as his father's successor. Now, as Domesticus of the East, Nicephorus made Leo and John Zemiskis as two chief subordinates and he began to plot a more coordinated strategy between the armies for the following year. By the time he took command, this was around 954 to 955. It seems that Nicephorus spent 955 in a state of relative quiet, planning his moves, reorganizing, and Saif al-Dallah, for his part, was also busy. He had to suppress a series of revolts by tribal leaders and his own officers, but he was able to do so successfully. Going into 956, Saif had secured his rear, and he was now at the peak of his power since he had successfully unified his rear, and he was ready to go on the offensive. I don't think he had any reason to believe that Nicephorus would prove to be any more of a problem than Bardos had been, so Saif could look forward to continued plunder and maybe a couple of minor territorial gains here and there. The campaign season of 956, however, demonstrated that things had fundamentally changed and that Nicephorus operated on a different order of scale than his father before him had dreamt of. Saif decided to strike north toward Armenia and the east, and he was successful in his own campaign as he met and narrowly defeated John Zemiskis. The battle, however, was indecisive and doesn't seem to have done much damage to Zemiskis army or standing. While this was going on, Leo Phocas invaded Saif's territory, won a victory, and managed to capture one of Saif's cousins. Another subordinate, the Strategos Basil Hexamilites, was able to destroy the fleet of Tarsus and then use the new naval supremacy to burn the city's suburbs. And what this did, the destruction of the Tarsian fleet, was to open up Cilicia to Byzantine attacks while also weakening Saif's chief ally in the region. It appears that Nicephorus understood that there was an inherent link between the various emirates and powers of the Arab world, and that Saif was something like the nerve center or the leader amongst this alliance. So one way to bring him down is to strike at his allies. When he knew that his chief ally was in deep trouble, Saif decided to abandon his offensive in the north in order to enter Cilicia to keep Tarsus loyal. The Tarsiates, after the shocking destruction of their fleet, were thinking about defecting, but they decided to remain loyal. 
While the most important victory of 956 was without a doubt Basil Hexamilites' naval victory, the thing that really excited Constantine VII was the capture of one of Saif's cousins. So, in 956, when he celebrated the triumph for the year's achievements, i.e. Nicephorus' achievements that year, the triumph centered around Leo's victory and Saif's cousin who was paraded through the streets of Constantinople. During 957 and 958, Nicephorus kept up his efforts. His armies worked to keep Saif off balance and to weaken the key cities of Hadath and Samosata. In 959, the Byzantines were probing all over the place, having now fully taken the initiative. Zemiskis was able to mount a deep raid all the way to Nisibis and Dara on the Euphrates River. So this is well into the rear of Saif's territory and a feat that is pretty bold. In 960, Leo also hit Cilicia, penetrating almost to Tarsus, and then raided to draw out Saif. When Saif came out to play, Leo was able to inflict a minor defeat on the emir. However, this was something of a tweak on the nose to try to keep Saif busy and to deter him from action since the Byzantine world was preparing for something a little more important at that time. In the early 9th century, there had been a power struggle in Al-Andalus, and a number of political exiles had left. Several years later, they decided to create a new homeland, and they invaded and captured the island of Crete. Ever since its fall in the early 9th century, the Emirate of Crete had proven to be a major thorn in the side of the Byzantine Empire, and it was the absolute bane of coastal communities. Not only was the island effectively a pirate haven, the rulers of the island often engage in piracy themselves, but it also would serve as a kind of way station and security for Arab fleets which would sail from Syria. The most devastating raid in Byzantine history came all the way from Syria from Leo of Tripoli when he destroyed Thessalonica in the early 10th century. However, had Crete been in Byzantine hands, it's possible that they would have intercepted this fleet or that Leo of Tripoli would not have had the gumption to try and do something on that scale, since he would have been too worried about Byzantine control of the seas and his own supply lines. Suffice it to say that the Byzantines were well aware of Crete's strategic value and that it was hurting their recovery, especially in the inland Aegean, to have all of this piracy going rampant. There had been five previous expeditions to try to eliminate the Emirate of Crete, the most recent of which was in 949, under Constantine VII, who was still emperor at this time. All of these had failed, and all of the failures were both costly and embarrassing. By 958 to 959, Constantine VII was in the middle of planning out another great expedition to Crete, and it seems that he was planning to give command of this expedition to Basil Lycopinus, one of the surviving sons of Romanus I, who had, in the years since, become a great friend and supporter of Constantine VII. However, Constantine VII did not live to see this expedition carried out. He died in 959, and he was succeeded by his son Romanus II. Romanus II, if anything, seems to have had even more enthusiasm for the project of conquering Crete than even his late father, and it's possible that he even enhanced the scope of the expedition beyond what Constantine had been proposing. Field units from all of the Empire's themes were detached for this expedition. For whatever reason, Romanus decided that the expedition would need a new commander. We don't know what his relationship with Basil Lycopinus was like, but he decided to go for Nicephorus Phocas. My thinking would be that what Romanus was looking for is someone who was used to commanding a massive army and coordinating a lot of disparate parts. And no one in the empire by this juncture had that kind of experience other than Nicephorus Phocas, who'd been doing it for four or five years by the time the expedition launched in 960. When Nicephorus took command of his combined naval and land force, he decided to sail directly in and make an attempt at Shandox, the capital of the Emirate of Crete. He arrived in July of 960. I won't go through all the details of this siege simply because I have an entire video dedicated to this topic already. Suffice it to say that we don't have a very clear account of the precise sequence of events, 
but we have all the typical things one associates with siege warfare. There are raids, ambushes, and after summer passed into winter, the winter proved to be especially bitter. The Emir of Crete predictably tried to send for aid far and wide to all of his Muslim neighbors, and despite some promises from a few of them, nothing ever materialized. Nicephorus' huge force, for its part, also required a lot of supplies, and the besieged were doing a pretty good job of laying waste to the land, so uh, he had to rely very heavily on Joseph Bringas to supply things from other territories in the empire. So Bringas had to mount a fairly significant logistical operation to keep Nicephorus' men fed and clothed. After winter broke, in the early spring, Nicephorus resumed attempting to assault the city. On March 6th or 7th, he was able to create a breach by undermining the walls, and then his men stormed the city. The emir and his son were taken captive, and the city was now Byzantine, as well as the entire island of Crete. The fall of Crete in 961 was one of the most important events in Byzantine history. It was also arguably the key event in Nicephorus' career and the thing that put him in contention for the throne. Nicephorus, when he returned to Constantinople, celebrated a grand triumph alongside of Romanus II, and he became an empire-wide hero for this great deed. His brother Leo also acquitted himself well in Nicephorus' absence. He won a victory in the west and then a smashing victory over Saif in the east. So between them, the two brothers, Phocas, had done quite well. The conquest of Crete facilitated demographic and economic growth in the inland Aegean heartland of the empire, as well as adding Crete, which was a fairly prosperous island, an important trade uh, junction, and also a place that was strategically vital. The capture of Crete was easily one of the most significant victories of the entire 10th century. And of course, 10th century being the time when the Byzantines were more or less at their peak. So that actually says quite a bit. The positive impacts of taking Crete would be felt for decades and decades. And this is something that's hard to exactly quantify, but the recapture of Crete did lead to a great deal of prosperity and would give Byzantium quite a bit more strength in subsequent decades than it otherwise would have had. By the middle of 961, most of the expedition's field units had returned to their home bases. By the year's end, Nicephorus had resumed his role as Domesticus of the East, and he took his army into the field in Cilicia. I assume that much of his haste was due to him trying to best capitalize on Leo's victory over Saif and to strike while Saif's army would not be much of a threat. This would enable him to more... Um, easily deal with things like siege warfare, which can leave an army vulnerable if there is a field army nearby. In February of 962, Nicephorus was able to force the surrender of Anazarbus, and then he worked to try to create a dead zone between Cilicia and Syria by laying waste to the land in between. This would make it harder for Saif to arrive, and would mean that Saif, when he did arrive, would be short on supplies and more obliged to risk battle. Tarsus refused to um, surrender to the Byzantines, but they did try to come up with a compromised position by swearing off their allegiance to Saif. They thought that his star was sinking, and they wanted to try to plot their own course as a kind of neutral or light ally of Byzantium. The governor, however, decided to try to take advantage and sally out to win a victory over the Byzantines. When he sallied out, however, he was defeated and he was so embarrassed by his defeat, or perhaps just despaired about the future of Tarsus so much, that he elected to leap off of a high tower rather than get back to the negotiating table. In 962, after winter had ended, Saif was very much anxious to get into Cilicia to try to shore up his allies and to put a stop to what Nicephorus was attempting. So he marched directly into Cilicia, trying to challenge Nicephorus. However, this proved to be a mistake and possibly even a trap. When he marched into Cilicia, what he found is that 
Zemiskis was able to then march directly at his capital at Aleppo and threaten his rear. Saif was then forced to retreat to defend his capital, and now Nicephorus came in from Cilicia, so Saif found himself trapped. In November of 962, the Byzantines were able to sack the city of Hierapolis, and then the armies converged on Aleppo in December. At this point, Saif was trying to save his capital, but he didn't want to fully commit his army, lest he be deprived of it altogether and then lose all of his power. So what he tried to do is to defeat the Byzantines in detail. First, he ordered his subordinate general Naha to attack Zemiskis, and Zemiskis was able to defeat Naha. Saif then combined his forces with Naha's survivors and made an all-out assault against Zemiskis and once again lost. Zemiskis not only won the battle, but created such a rout that he was able to pursue Saif all the way to the Euphrates River. So this was a great strategic success for Nicephorus, who was now able to lay siege to Aleppo in earnest without having to worry about Saif's dispersed army. Watching their lord Saif scurry off to the Euphrates defeated, public order in Aleppo collapsed, and the city surrendered voluntarily on December 24th. The Byzantines looted the city for a week. It was full of all kinds of plunder from the decades of success that Saif had presided over. And they were able to capture everything in the city except for the citadel, which was held by men who were still loyal to Saif. The fall of Aleppo was a signal moment for the Muslim world. They had lost the momentum years ago, but for the most part, the frontiers have been stable, and Saif was one of the great heroes of the Muslim world since he had been able to hold his own against Kirkawas and then Bardas. However, the fall of Aleppo signaled that the problem was far worse than they had realized, and this was something that gets recorded in the sources as a time of real panic. Saif's realm was never quite the same after the sack of Aleppo. His myth of kind of invincibility, I mean, he had suffered defeats before, but his kind of aura was really diminished by this uh, event, and it proved that he couldn't defend his own capital, so his prestige went down among everyone. After the fall of Aleppo, Nicephorus was awarded a second triumph. During his triumphal procession, a relic of John the Baptist recovered from Aleppo featured prominently. This seems to have really triggered something in Nicephorus. In the future, every time that he would parade in Constantinople for a triumph, he would feature recovered relics and really try to use that as one of the main reasons for his campaigns. This is something of a Christianized Roman triumph. Around this time, the Byzantines were really interested in their Roman heritage, and they were trying to bring back the triumph, but to divest it of any kind of pagan roots that it might have while inserting Christian material. So one way to do that, one quick solution, is to find religious relics from the East and then put them on parade. Of course, every city claimed to have parts of the true cross or parts of the Holy Spear or other random things, so it was pretty easy to find relics that you could then put on display in Constantinople to prove how great your campaigns were. After his triumph, Nicephorus returned to his headquarters in Cappadocia to begin planning his operations for 963. With Aleppo crippled, he was no doubt thinking that the time was ripe to try to conquer Cilicia outright. And that most likely is what he was planning on doing in 963. However, in March of that year, before he was able to begin campaigning in earnest, Nicephorus received news that Romanus II had died suddenly at the age of 25. Romanus had two young sons, Basil II and Constantine VIII, and they would clearly need a guardian. Now, the Empress Theophano was still alive, so she would probably head the Regency Council, but she was not someone who had all that much political experience, and Romanus had chosen her as empress mostly because of her looks. So it would clearly be up to other men to make sure that the government kept running until Basil II could come of age. Initially, Nicephorus, Joseph Bringas, the Patriarch, uh, Paul Euctus, and the Senate were all in agreement that a council of regency was necessary and Nicephorus gave an oath that he would remain loyal and not revolt, uh, 
and that he would help out and also have a voice in the government as things went forward. It appears that with all the exchanges of mutual assurances of faith, that there was some distrust because everyone understood that power was up for grabs and that this power would last for at least 15 or so years and could extend quite a bit longer um, if someone decided to be a second Romanus I. There was a breakdown in this relationship, the reasons for which are not clear, but as one would expect based on the way that um, Byzantine aristocrats wrote about history, the blame for the struggle was assigned to the eunuch Bringas. Apparently people who don't have testicles cannot be trusted, and also the beautiful Empress Theophano, who is portrayed as a seductress and a conspirator. But I think this narrative is rather simplistic, and it is a little bit too in line with the stereotypes that Byzantine authors like to present. Despite the narrative and the sources about Bringas and Theophano being the chief movers of this conflict and Nicephorus just being forced to react to protect his own position, the fact is that I think it's a lot more likely that Nicephorus was the aggressor in this conflict and that his aggression came from the feeling that he was entitled to the throne for his achievements, that if he didn't claim the throne, his command in the east would be threatened, and also that things just kind of added up in a way. Nicephorus was a widower, and Theophano was a widow. Nicephorus was someone who had a lot of experience commanding armies. That's one thing that Byzantine emperors frequently did, although the last couple had not. So I think in his mind, this was his destiny, and it was his best way to continue his campaigns since he would now have the full resources of the empire guaranteed. Nicephorus was the first to show signs of aggression in terms of acting as emperor and issuing orders and decrees. One of his first acts was to name John Zemiskis as his successor as Domesticus of the East. Long celibate, it is highly unlikely that Nicephorus was seduced by Theophano. Um, also, some of our accounts of Nicephorus portray him as being a very plain looking or even somewhat ugly man. So it's unlikely that, you know, a very attractive woman in her mid-twenties would have really been into a guy who was a little over 50 and had never really been very good looking to begin with. Bringas most likely did not harbor some sort of deep-seated grudge against Nicephorus until Nicephorus began marching west and uh, gearing up at Chalcedon to cross in force. And another thing I think that the narratives get wrong is that the primary opponent for Nicephorus when it came to controlling the boy emperors and the Byzantine government was not the eunuch, eunuch Bringus, who could not hold the throne in his own name and whose grasp on power would never be secure simply because of the high prejudice against eunuchs, but rather Bringas' chief ally, the general Marianus Arguros, someone who had been a staunch ally of Constantine VII and was a war hero in his own right due to his deeds in Italy and then in the Balkans. He also happened to be the most prestigious general in the empire who was not a member of the Phocas family. And because of that, he was a something of a rival for Nicephorus. And once Nicephorus played his cards for Marianus, it was clear that if Nicephorus were to take the throne, his career would end, so he might as well contend for the throne. So that is how I would explain the events of 963, this Byzantine Game of Thrones. By August 963, Nicephorus had mustered his forces in preparation to cross the Bosphorus, and he was just waiting on the boats to ferry him over. In the meantime, his opponents were struggling to keep control of Constantinople. Bringas had moved quickly to try to arrest Leo and Bardas, who both happened to be in the capital, but Leo Phocas had been able to escape by dressing incognito as a common worker and then taking a small boat across the straits to join his brother. Old Bardas, who was still alive, was too old to move in such a way, so he instead took refuge in the Hagia Sophia and refused to leave. 
Bringas was going to simply drag him out and then take him captive and use him as a bargaining tool, but the people happened to be in church that day, and they rallied around Bardos, both because of his right to claim sanctuary, because of Bringas' unpopularity as a unit tax collector, and also because of Bardos's son's hero status. Erwan wanted Bardos to be safe, and therefore they decided that they would fight soldiers if they came to try to arrest him by force. So what we had was a kind of standoff between the population and Bringas' soldiers. And one thing about pre-modern warfare, which isn't readily apparent, is that due to the relative small number of soldiers that there were relative to the population, and also the inability of ancient weapons to kill en masse, um, if you have an entire population of a city against the garrison there, the advantage lays not with the garrison, but with the populace. So Bringas was more or less hand-tied. Arguros, who was a good deal more um, popular and liked than Bringas, decided to bring some of his loyal soldiers to the Hagia Sophia and try to arrest Bardas that way. However, he underestimated the crowd's support for the Focates, and a woman actually threw something off of a roof, some sort of heavy object that hit him on the head and caused a fatal concussion. With Arguros dead and Bringas being as unpopular as he was, once the um, enemy forces started to move, the cause was dead. Basil Lycopinus, who was still alive and living in the capital, managed to gather together 3,000 people who were not fans of Bringas, and he started effectively a riot, which was enough to put Bringas into hiding. And now all the Focades had to do was simply enter the city and take control. Soon after Arguros's body became room temperature, Leo crossed in force and secured the city for his brother. Nicephorus soon followed, entering on August 16th and being crowned by the patriarch Polyuctus on the same day at the age of 51. Nicephorus named Leo as his right-hand man in the capital, and we'll see that Leo performed a wide variety of tasks on his brother's behalf over the next several years. The elderly Bardos was also named as Caesar, which was a purely um, honorary title in this event since Bardos was highly unlikely to outlive the boy emperors or Nicephorus. It was, however, a way to ensure that Bardos became more of an urban legend after his defiance of the cruel Bringas and his survival in the face of great danger, and also his relationship with the people who had rallied to his side. Nicephorus married Theophano and then became the guardian and colleague of the two boy emperors. Nicephorus had long been a widower and he had no sons, so this would presumably prevent the kind of succession struggle that we saw between Constantine VII and two of the sons of Romanus Lycopinus. I would be remiss if I didn't mention, however, that Leo Phocas had a number of adult sons and that had Nicephorus lived out all of his natural days, it is very possible that one of those boys would have then tried to claim the throne and pitted his claim against Basil and Constantine. But for reasons we'll get into, that never materialized. From the outset, Nicephorus was wildly popular with everyone. Not only had he liberated them from the perceived tyranny of the tax man um, Bringas, but he had also captured Crete, he had won victories in the east, he had brought back relics. Nicephorus was the man of the hour. He was one of the greatest generals they had ever seen, and that's high praise given that they had just seen Kirkawas a, several, a couple decades before. So um, Nicephorus looked like he was in for a very popular and successful reign. But I think that the seeds of Nicephorus' downfall were present from the very beginning. What I'd like to do is take a look at his character, since I think that when you have a monarchy, the significance of the ruler's personality is something that you have to take into account. And if someone is not quite geared toward being a good ruler, then their reign will be troubled. While Nicephorus's training and temperament suited him well when it came to military command, these same skills didn't necessarily translate to the throne. 
Nicephorus's biography is a little unclear since we don't know a lot of the chronology of the events of his personal life, but we know that he lost his wife to illness and later that his son died in a hunting accident and that he never remarried and therefore remained childless after his son's death. He was celibate and led an ascetic lifestyle. Supposedly, he did not consume meat. We don't have very many instances of things that he said. The only thing that we know that he said is when he was on Crete, they catapulted a donkey over the walls of Shandox and equipped that the donkey was flying like an eagle. So if Nicephorus did have a sense of humor, it was a very minimal one. It was grim gallows humor, and frankly, he wasn't that funny. He also had a very strong opinion when it came to religion. Now, most emperors were fairly pious and they had some theological views, but Nicephorus's focus was more on what you might call ethics and lifestyle. And the thing that really pissed him off in no end was when you would have churchmen having a lot of worldly wealth. One of the things he was interested in doing was curbing that worldliness in churchmen, and that's not something they took kindly to since many of the people in the church had become accustomed to living a grand lifestyle. His other great interest, however, was continuing to expand imperial borders, and this meant that he was largely indifferent to the wishes of either the common people or the aristocracy. The only people that he cared for were his own soldiers. And at first, he was able to get away with this because he was bringing in victory after victory, but he never evolved as an emperor, and eventually people got sick of him. He didn't have the capacity to grow or change, and that is ultimately what cost him his life. One of Nicephorus's first acts as emperor in 963 was to send reinforcements to Sicily. That year, he received word that Arab forces were laying siege to Remeda, a Byzantine outpost in Sicily, one of the last few remaining. Therefore, Nicephorus commissioned a new force under the command of a pious eunuch named Nicetus, and he attached a cavalry unit to that um, force under his nephew Manuel, who may have been one of the sons of Leo. It's not exactly clear. And unfortunately for young Manuel, his only claim to fame is that our sources are explicit in characterizing him as someone who was impetuous and incapable of exercising command. There are two accounts of how this campaign went. Leo the deacon has a, an interesting but clearly false um, description. In his account, the force under Nicetus was able to effectively liberate all of eastern Sicily, including Syracuse, Leontini, and a bunch of other places before marching into the interior and then being ambushed and destroyed. The Arab sources make a bit more sense. Nicetus landed at Messina, which was not far away from Rometta. He marched directly to Rometta to try to lift the siege, and he was crushed early. Nicetus was then captured, and Byzantine ships were disabled by divers who messed with their rudders. Now, the last part, I don't know how true that was, but the rest of it seems rather plausible. Nicetus was an inexperienced commander who had just gotten in the theater, and it should come as no surprise that he didn't really know the lay of the land too well. Also, if you have a bunch of men who have just gotten done with a long sea journey and you disembark and then try to fight immediately, what you'll find is that these men are somewhat enervated from all of the inactivity on board and that they will not be as effective as they would be if they were given time to recuperate from their journey. So all of this makes sense except for the part about the divers, whereas Leo's account is patently ridiculous. In 964, after only a year or so of being emperor, Nicephorus II decided to act on his religious preferences and try to reform the church in his own image. He issued a decree forbidding endowments for new monasteries and charitable foundations while banning gifts of land to existing ones. It's possible that his motive was to try to prevent the super concentration of land in the hands of churchmen because he needed land to support his soldiers in the themes but mostly it seems to have been driven by his desire to not have churchmen who were too worldly. Donors were now limited in the ways that they could support the church. They could still give cash or movable goods, 
And they could sell land to religious foundations, but they couldn't simply give it. Whether there were regulations on how much they had to sell the land for is unknown. Nicephorus loudly blasted the worldliness of churchmen in his decree, and he also said that donors donated as much as they did out of vanity rather than true piety. They just wanted to be remembered as being extraordinarily generous and get a bunch of worldly credit for that. Needless to say, I doubt that either the churchmen who stood to gain from these donations or the donors who liked to make them to salve their guilty consciences were terribly pleased by this action or Nicephorus's characterization of their motives. At the same time, Nicephorus also did lavish his favors on one of his friends, Athanasius of Athos, and his new monastery at Mount Athos. So, from the perspective of someone else in the church who was not inclined the way that Nicephorus was, you can see how all of this would come off as hypocritical. But Nicephorus was a man of strong will, and this early in his regime, he was still pretty popular, so this was not something that occasioned too much outrage, although the church began to have some doubts about him. Meanwhile, back in the east, Nicephorus's absence meant that there was a much-needed breather for Tarsus and Aleppo, both of which had been on the brink of falling at the time of Nicephorus's departure for Constantinople. Both Tarsus and Saif al-Dala were able to launch raids in the Byzantine lands in 963, with much of Nicephorus's force away from the front trying to secure the throne. However, the Tarsiates were not lucky in their return journey, as there were still Byzantine forces protecting the frontiers. As was frequently the case, what the Byzantines would do was to allow a raid to complete and then guard the mountain passes out. Heavily laden men trying to pass through narrow spaces were quite vulnerable. The Tarsiates do not seem to have suffered as crushing a defeat as Saif had suffered at the hands of Leo Phocas, but they did take some losses. Saif himself was not struck down by Byzantine forces, but rather by a stroke while he was on the march at the age of 46, and while he doesn't seem to have lost any of his mental faculties, he does seem to have suffered some ill physical effects for the rest of his life. When we next meet him, he is said to have been born by a litter, so he has lost much of his physical vigor, and this will make it that much harder for him to try to reinvigorate the Emirate of Aleppo. Nicephorus never forgot about the East and his goals there. By the end of the year, December of 963, Zemiskis was back in action in Cilicia. He struck the city of Adana and then defeated a combined army from the Cilician cities, slaying 5,000 survivors who tried to make a final stand on a nearby hill, this place later being called the Mountain of Blood. Saif later arrived in a litter to aid his allies with another army, but Zemiskis by that point had withdrawn. Nicephorus soon arrived in, on the front with his family. They would stay in a border fort while he campaigned, and he seems to have arranged some kind of a truce with Saif so that he wouldn't intervene in Cilicia. There were continued operations to weaken Adana, Mopsuestia, and Tarsus. These would be the primary targets of Byzantine operations for the next two years. While in the middle of his campaign to conquer Cilicia, Nicephorus decided to make a much easier conquest. In early 965, he announced that he was ending the condominium rent-sharing arrangement between the Empire and the Abbasid Caliphate, and that the island of Cyprus would now be fully and simply Byzantine. The reason he was able to do this is, of course, because of the destruction of the Tarsiate fleet and then the Byzantine conquest of Crete. The sea was looking quite favorable for Byzantine forces, and it was looking like it would be very hard for the various Muslim powers to conquer Cyprus or to expel its Greek population. So, um, there was really no danger in making this move at this time. The move had always been somewhat favorable to the Byzantines, despite the fact that Cyprus had always more or less been a Byzantine province, but um, it was vulnerable and it was in a sea of Arab powers. It was right next to Syria, there were fleets nearby, and this was actually something that had really helped the Byzantines before. But now there was no reason for it. So 
Cyprus had always been basically a theme, and now the difference is it would be officially organized as such. It wasn't hard to do. Nicephorus sent an official named Nicetus uh, Chalcutsis, and he was able to quickly get things set up. One of the sources from the Arab world, Yahya of Antioch, says that an Egyptian fleet tried to challenge the Byzantines for Cyprus, but that when they sailed up to Cyprus, they were smashed by Byzantine forces, and that more or less sealed the deal. So now Byzantium controlled Cyprus, and all it took was the stroke of a pen. Going into the summer of 965, Nicephorus and his generals planned the final conquest of Cilicia. For this operation, he decided to turn to his two most trusted commanders, his brother Leo and his nephew Zemiskis, and they would all command different forces during this operation. Before this offensive, it seems that the governor of Tarsus got word that this was coming, and he tried to request terms to maybe become an ally, but Nicephorus was bent on conquest and refused his offer to surrender in a negotiated fashion. Nicephorus accompanied Zemiskis in a siege against Mopsuestia, while Leo invested Tarsus. Mopsuestia fell on July 13th after the walls were tunneled. Most of the denizens of the city were slaughtered or enslaved. After the fall of Mopsuestia, Zemiskis remained behind, and Nicephorus advanced to join Leo at Tarsus. The siege at Tarsus was going well. Leo had effectively cut off the city, and supplies were running short. Starving and despairing of the promised relief from Egypt, Tarsus decided to surrender on August 16th, the two-year anniversary of Nicephorus' accession. Three days later, the Egyptian relief fleet finally arrived, but it was too late. Muslims in Tarsus were told to either convert or leave, and those who elected to leave were safely escorted by Byzantine forces to Antioch. Nicephorus did his best to repopulate this strategically placed city with loyal citizens, mostly of Armenian extraction. Some Muslims would later decide that the call of home was too great to ignore, and they returned and agreed to convert to Orthodox Christianity to be allowed to live in Tarsus once again. A little later in 965, one of the mop-up operations took the city of Germanicia, and with that city conquered, there was no longer an independent Muslim presence in Cilicia, so the conquest had been completed. In October, Nicephorus returned to Constantinople, and he celebrated the triumph with all of the battle standards recovered from Tarsus and the city's gates, which had been removed and then gilded and would now be displayed as permanent victory monuments. This was one of the more secular of his triumphs, as we don't hear of any relics being displayed. Perhaps this is because all of the relics from Cilicia had already been used, and most of the relics that he had been finding on his campaigns had always come from Syria and parts further east. Due to his conquest of Cilicia and the pressure that he was exerting in Syria, Nicephorus' conquest were making things a little more difficult for the Syrian Jacobite church. As we'll see, oftentimes when the Byzantines would advance under Nicephorus, this would cause anxiety in the Muslim world, and that would often be expressed through violence toward Christian communities. So the Syrian Jacobite church was looking to potentially relocate in order to avoid such incidents. Around 965, as he was completing his conquest of Cilicia, Nicephorus met with Patriarch Yuhanan VII Saritga of the Syrian Jacobite Church, and he offered to exchange toleration for the Jacobites if Yuhanan would agree to re relocate his patriarchal seat to Melitene, which was further to the rear and a much safer place within Byzantium's borders. However, in 969, it appears that Nicephorus, for whatever reason, decided to change his mind. He summoned Yuhanan VII and other bishops to Constantinople, and he called a synod to debate doctrine. At the synod, of course, Nicephorus and the Orthodox bishops were declared the victors, and they demanded that Yuhanan VII renounce Jacobite um, doctrine and adopt Orthodoxy, but the Jacobites refused. They were then ordered into exile, thus rendering the earlier agreement completely pointless. So Nicephorus, while for the most part he was a very determined guy, um, he sometimes did change his mind about things, and 
he shared a lot of the kind of religious bigotry towards other denominations that we see with pretty much every other emperor. So his reign can never be put down as simply a Christian versus Muslim straight up brawl in that sense. It just was never quite that clear cut or simple. Back in Italy, things continued to not go well for the Byzantine cause. It would appear that there were no more enclaves in Sicily and that the fighting shifted to Italy proper. The governor of Longobardia and Calabria, Nicephorus Hexacianides, tried to relieve the siege of Rometta in 965, but when he tried to raise forces for that operation, his subjects refused to participate. One town supposedly even burned its own boats to prevent going to this conflict over in Sicily. In May 965, Rometta fell. In 965-966, Hexacianides was killed in action near Reggio in the boot tip of Italy. Nicephorus was ready for peace with the Fatimids after all of this, and he and Al-Muiz signed a contract in 967 where he exchanged ransom money in a sword of Muhammad in exchange for Nicetus, his general who had failed earlier and other captives, and a peace agreement between them. By peace, of course, we mean a truce. There was never a formal peace system. It was more or less just an armistice. For al Muiz's part, his reason for quitting while he was ahead was not because he thought he couldn't make any further headway, but rather because he wanted to invade Egypt and take out his rival there. Also at the end of 965, Nicephorus made another decision which would ultimately come back to bite him in the ass. Toward the end of that year, Nicephorus removed Zemiskis as Domesticus of the East. The reasons for Zemiskis' removal are far from clear, however. Zemiskis seems to have retired to an estate on the eastern side of the Bosphorus, not far from the capital. Whatever Zemiskis' loyalty and intentions before, after being removed as Domesticus in this fashion, he now definitely harbored a grudge against his uncle and began scheming in earnest. It's possible that scheming was what got him removed in the first place, but we'll never know. It is rather pointless to speculate any further, except to say that Nicephorus probably should have kept a closer eye on Zemiskis if he did suspect his loyalty. With Cilicia securely Byzantine, Syria and its major centers, such as Aleppo and Antioch, became the new targets of Byzantine expansion in the east. At this time, Antioch still had a sizable Orthodox Christian population, but most of them were now Arabic speakers and were not culturally compatible with the norms of the Byzantine realm. While Antioch retained a lot of symbolic value because of its status during the Roman Empire, the city had declined in wealth, population, and importance since late antiquity. As for Aleppo, the Byzantines themselves had greatly weakened it a few years before by sacking it. So this meant that Syria was ripe for the picking, but that it perhaps was not the most plush target, and it might be a little logistically challenging since these areas were not doing all that well at the time. While his physical body, his realm, and his wealth were all in tatters, Saif al Dalla remained determined to fight to the bitter end and to recover all that he had lost. At a prisoner exchange with the Byzantines, Saif had to give up his jewels due to the imbalance of POWs, since obviously Nicephorus had been doing far better in these wars than he had. But he needed these prisoners because he was going to embark on further military campaigns. The former governor of Tarsus, Rashik al Nasimi, had migrated to Antioch and then he rose to power in the city as the head of the anti-Hamdanid faction. The Hamdanids, of course, are the family that Saif held from. And at this time, what Rashik tried to do was to offer to accept Byzantine suzerainty in exchange for attacking Saif. It's not clear whether Nicephorus gave him the green light or whether Rashik decided to attack Saif in order to gain credibility and then get rewarded later. At any rate, though, Rashik marched on Aleppo, but he was killed in action. Saif quickly sprang into action, mobilized his army, and marched on Antioch, seizing the city in 966, uh, June of the year, 
And then he imprisoned all of his political opponents, all of the anti-Hamdanids in the city. This was seen as a provocation by Nicephorus, who didn't like the prospect of a unified Syria under Saif al-Dawah, who, despite his setbacks and his health problems, was still a dangerous and determined foe. It appears that Nicephorus II and Saif had been engaged in talks about some kind of a settlement prior to the fall of Antioch, but when Saif suddenly seized the city, this more or less frightened Nicephorus, and he decided that he had to act in order to prevent Saif from recovering. So he duly invaded Syria. The campaign of 966 was inconclusive due to supply shortages. Nicephorus was not fully prepared to undertake this campaign, and he, all he was able to do was disrupt what Saif was able to do without being able to really make too many solid gains. At one point, Nicephorus laid siege to the city of Hierapolis, but he left on October 6th when they offered him a relic in exchange for his departure. Nicephorus then arrived at Antioch on October 23rd, but he found that the faction that he had been funding, which was the anti-Hamdanid faction, was a lot less effective than he had thought, and that the ancient fortifications of the city, while they were quite old, were still strong and would be a real danger to try to assault. So he decided to withdraw, thinking that discretion is the better part of valor. Saif, for his part, despite all of the successes of the year, continued to decline in terms of his health. He went back to Aleppo and died on February 8, 967. His death marks the end of the Emirate of Aleppo in any meaningful sense, and at a stroke, literally, um, the Byzantine world was rid of its greatest foe, and the East was now wide open for several years to come. Following the 966 campaign, Nicephorus would begin to spend a lot more time at home in Constantinople. However, his presence in the city did not necessarily enhance his popularity. If anything, it vastly undermined his standing with the people. One of Nicephorus's shortcomings as a ruler is that because he was so soldier-centered and so indifferent to other people, he didn't even attempt to enforce discipline on his soldiers when they were not in the field, and if they committed outrages against civilians, those outrages tended to go unpunished. He also managed to outrage ecclesiastical opinion by demanding that all soldiers who were killed fighting Muslims be treated as martyrs. Now, it's possible that this was a made-up charge by his political opponents to try to make him sound more ridiculous and more over-the-top in his support for soldiers, but it also is possible since all of his triumphs featured so many relics. The patriarch Polyuctus, for his part, was still pretty upset that Nicephorus had violated his oath of loyalty before he then broke it and seized power in 963. So while Polyuctus had been on the sidelines, if a plot were to emerge, he might prove to be a problem, or if the people went to him to complain, he might say the wrong thing. And it seems that Nicephorus may have had a little bit of awareness that he couldn't fully trust Polyuctus, although he did not go the further step of removing him and replacing him with someone more pliable. One of the major problems Nicephorus had during this time is that unlike pretty much all of the emperors of the Romans going back all the way to Augustus, Nicephorus was not really able to deal with public criticism. It was a common thing in both ancient Rome and in Constantinople for common people to express their frustration by saying vulgar things to emperors as they passed by, and most emperors took it in good stead. It was just kind of a tradition. But for Nicephorus, he took this very personally and tended to punish hecklers for insults that his predecessors would have ignored. This came off as being not just intemperate, but also as cruel, and it made him seem inhuman and hubristic and really just didn't endear him to the people of his own city. Nicephorus's various wars, while part of the funding for it came from all of the plunder that he gathered, still cost a lot of money in the form of taxes. And because he kept himself at war almost constantly, this meant that he had to be a very strict tax collector, and this won him no favors either among the peasantry or the aristocracy. Despite himself hailing from the military aristocracy, 
Nicephorus decided to maintain the financial policies of the Macedonian dynasty, which protected common farmers from having their land purchased by rich people. This was to protect the thematic system. So a lot of members of the military aristocracy were disappointed by Nicephorus because they figured that with one of their own on the throne, that this would mean that they would all be able to enrich themselves at the expense of the commoners, but Nicephorus didn't allow that. He understood that in the long run, his tax base needed to be spread out. So he didn't allow his friends to enrich themselves, and they ceased to be his friends. The gripes against Nicephorus's tax um, collection was so widespread that not only did it make it into the Greek sources, but even the Arab sources heard about it from their Greek contacts and talked about how Nicephorus was notorious for imposing very high taxes. Nicephorus also created a new type of coin, the Tatartaron. This is a gold coin that was lighter than the more standard Histamian by 1 12th. So it only had around 11 twelfths of the gold that the previous Histamian had. So this might have created a little bit of inflation, but probably not too much. Um, as Caldellus points out in his book, which covers this, um, a lot of what maintains the value of any currency is public confidence rather than the metal itself. So most likely whatever effect it had inflation-wise was not too great. But many of the aristocracy who already hated him for his taxation would claim that this was an absolutely ruinous policy and that it was completely degenerate and terrible. In the hostile tradition of the aristocrats who were worried about their taxes and about the currency, they claimed that Nicephorus only paid out his own debts in the new coin, but demanded taxes in the older coin type. The idea being that he would then recast coins and end up making more money off of his taxes while paying out less in value. But that simply is not true. We know this because, one, we have coin hoards and we have enough of a numismatic record to know that the state paid out in both types and collected in both types and that the state officially treated both types as equal all the way until the end of the 11th century. So Nicephorus didn't try to pull anything fast. He simply wanted to create a new type of coin that he could mint more, uh, more of. And he succeeded in that without causing any kind of inflation or any kind of real disruption to the Byzantine economy. So actually, this was a pretty successful policy, but for people who already hated him because of how much money they were paying in taxes, they suspected his motives and his competence when it came to anything financially related. In the negative tradition, as recorded by Skylitzes, what we see is that Nicephorus portrayed as a greedy, incompetent, and altogether vicious emperor who allowed his people to suffer while he and his circle prospered. Basically, there were feast for the elite and famine for everyone else. Now, clearly this tradition is exaggerated, but it may have borne some grain of truth. In Skylites, what we see is that the Focades would host emissaries and aristocrats in grand fashion with highly impressive displays of wealth and opulence. But we'd also know that there were reports of shortages throughout the empire. So the shortages may have been caused in part by the elaborate court life that Nicephorus, Leo, and their family enjoyed. Or at least that was the perception of many people in the empire. There were also widespread rumors that much of the shortages were caused by corruption on the part of Leo especially, but Nicephorus himself and their other senior officials and relatives. The idea being that these people who handled the public money were pocketing some of it for their own personal gain. Since Leo more or less directed the empire's finances, he came in for the sharpest criticism in that regard. Despite all of his victories and territorial acquisitions, Nicephorus's popularity steadily diminished, and by the end of his reign he was hated, and no one mourned his passing. While a general state of economic hardship can definitely undermine someone's popularity, it tends not to engender the kind of hatred that something like an outright massacre does. However, for Nicephorus, he would end up having to deal with both kinds of hatred. On Easter of most likely the year 967, 
A street brawl broke out between Armenian mercenaries and Byzantine sailors. While they were fighting each other, they also happened to involve a bunch of civilians, and this was recorded as a disgraceful incident which reflected poorly upon the military discipline being enforced by the emperor. Shortly after this, to help restore public order and maybe show that his troops in fact were disciplined, Nicephorus decided to stage military drills in the Hippodrome. Mostly the Hippodrome was used for public displays and races, but in this case he wanted to show off the one thing he was really good at, which is all things military. But instead of being impressed by the soldiers who were drilling, the crowd misinterpreted this as being Nicephorus's plot to murder them all. So something in the drill must have triggered the crowd. Perhaps they made an aggressive move toward the stands, or they moved more rapidly than the people thought was appropriate for such a drill. At any rate, someone must have cried something out like, we're going to all die, and everyone began to try to stampede toward the exits. Unfortunately, the Hippodrome was not designed to accommodate a massive high-speed departure by a crowd, and this meant that the crowd ended up panicking and stampeding many people in that crowd. So many deaths happened on that day. A lot of people died due to the panic of the crowd, and it was only when people noticed that the soldiers were still drilling and not attacking that the stampede ended. Nicephorus, for his part, offered no apology, and he most likely, as an elitist uh, soldier guy, thought that this was just people being stupid. So he ignored all of this and didn't attempt to um, really communicate about this issue at all. Days later, the rumor spread that this had been deliberate on his part and that he was just messing with their minds, and many of the relatives of the deceased had decided that Nicephorus was in fact guilty of this crime and that this had been his intention. So they followed him along while he was leaving church, they called him a murderer, and they threw rocks at him. And after this, he was a bit spooked, so he decided to erect another wall near the palace for additional protection, and he also decided to make himself more scarce when it came to his public appearances. Not only did this wall require other buildings to be demolished and thus offended even more people, but it also sent a message that he was being authoritarian and less accessible, and one thing that unpopular rulers don't seem to realize is that when you make yourself more scarce, that comes off as you being secretive or having something to hide. So this would further undermine his credibility with the people because now they just know that he's out plotting in the palace and that he has no interest in their well-being. Let's now shift our attention to the Balkans, the second front of the Byzantine Empire. Ever since Romanus I and Peter I had made a deal back in 927, the Balkans had been relatively peaceful, and Bulgaria and Byzantium lived side by side as neighbors and more or less as allies. Over the course of that period, 40 or so years, Byzantine attitudes toward Bulgaria had improved quite a bit, although there was still some cultural prejudice against the Scythian heritage of the Bulgarians. That being said, of course, uh, the Greco-Roman heritage of the Byzantines led them to more or less look down upon all of their neighbors, so you couldn't really say that they were singling out the Bulgarians in any way. However, starting in 966 or 967, we would see the growth of tension between Nicephorus and Peter. Supposedly, according to Leo the Deacon, this is due to Peter demanding tribute and then Nicephorus blowing his stack over it. In Leo's improbable account, Nicephorus blew his stack at the ambassador, said a bunch of things that were effectively racial stereotypes about the Bulgarians, raised his army, and then went to the Thracian border and began to seize forts left and right. Of course, he didn't name any of the forts that Nicephorus supposedly took, so most likely that never happened. Which leads to the question, what did happen? Well, we'll have to turn to a different source. Once again, Skylitzes has a much more probable account of what went down. In 967, Nicephorus decided to tour his Thracian frontier, and while he was there, he wrote to Peter requesting that in the future, the Bulgarian Tsar should do more to prevent future Magyar raids from reaching Byzantine lands. One thing we didn't talk about in this video is that while Nicephorus was away in Crete, 
there were two Magyar raids which hit Byzantine territory. Without some Bulgarian collusion, it's unlikely that those raids would have made it through. Peter, for whatever reason, despite being a mostly peaceful man, did not respond well to that request and effectively told Nicephorus that he wasn't willing to do more than what he was currently doing. It's possible at the same time that Nicephorus received word that the Rus were preparing to strike against Kherson, the uh, northernmost province of Byzantium in what is now the Crimea. So it's possible that after having gotten an unsatisfactory response from Peter, and then learning about a Rus threat to one of his isolated provinces that Nicephorus decided that it was time to let two of his problems deal with one another. Nicephorus dispatched a noble from Cherson named Kalokiros to the Rus in order to pay them to raid Bulgaria instead of whatever else they were planning on doing. So either he was trying to deflect the Rus or punish Peter or maybe both. It's pretty clear, though, that Nicephorus didn't see any danger in doing this and thought that he would avoid a lot of hardship by doing it, so he thought that he was being clever with this move. What ended up happening, though, is a perfect example of unintended consequences. Sobyatoslav and the Rus struck Bulgaria in 968, and they began to make rapid progress. Bulgaria hadn't been at war in about four decades, so none of the men in the ranks had any experience, most likely, and certainly Peter was too old to be militarily effective. The only thing that prevented Sovyatoslav from overrunning all of Bulgaria in 968 is that Peter was able to send emissaries to the Pechenegs further north, and they decided to attack Kiev while Sovyatoslav was away. Because he had left his family behind in his capital city at Kiev, Sebyatoslav had to withdraw from Bulgaria in order to save his own capital. However, he then returned the next year in 969 and continued to overrun Bulgaria. During this time, Nicephorus decided to make an outright ally of Bulgaria against Sebyatoslav and the Rus because he recognized that the Rus were a much greater threat than he had realized. At one point, Nicephorus also tried to arrange dynastic marriages between the young boy emperors Basil II and Constantine VIII with Bulgarian princesses, but this did not end up coming to fruition. Peter I in 969 suffered a debilitating stroke, and as his realm was crumbling and he was unable to do much about it, he decided to abdicate, he became a monk, and then he ended up passing away in early 970. By late 969, the end of Nicephorus' reign, Bulgaria was in the midst of a grave crisis, and the heir apparent to the Bulgarian throne, Boris II, was in Constantinople. But we won't talk more about that until we talk about the career of John Zemiskis, the successor to Nicephorus II. The emissary Calichirus, who was not a major player in Byzantine politics, decided to turn traitor and make his own bid for the Byzantine throne. He promised to pay Sevyatoslav and recognize his gains in Bulgaria if Sevyatoslav would help him seize the throne in Constantinople. This casual act of treason really shows exactly how vulnerable Nicephorus appeared in the eyes of the Byzantine aristocracy. It also implies that people like Calichirus perceived Nicephorus as weak and as lacking support. And that's pretty stunning given just how successful Nicephorus had been in his various wars, that random aristocrats who had no achievements to their names thought that they could easily take the throne. We're not told exactly what happened to Calichirus, but clearly he never became emperor, and most likely there was a deal of some kind between Nicephorus or his successor and the Rus, which involved killing Calichirus as a precautionary measure. Let us now shift our gaze even further to the west and look at the Byzantine holdings in South Italy. At this time, Otto I, who we now think of as the first Holy Roman Emperor, had become the most successful successor of Charlemagne and had imperial ambitions. He was calling himself Emperor of the Romans, and he was claiming himself as an heir to Charlemagne and by extension to the Roman Empire. He now was expanding into Italy and wanted to unify the whole peninsula and also get the Byzantines to recognize his claim to be Emperor of the Romans. Now, this was a problematic claim for a number of reasons, the most pertinent of which is that the Byzantines in the, west, in the east called themselves the Romanoi, the Hoi Romanoi in Greek. 
they were the Romans, and in their minds, no one else was. So if Otto I is claiming to be emperor of the Romans, he is effectively claiming to be the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. And that is their main reason for not approving of his use of the title. Otto, however, wanted to force them to recognize his claim. So one thing that he did was to try to unify Italy and force the Byzantines to the table. After winning over some key Lombard allies, Otto then invaded Byzantine South Italy and tried to lay siege to the city of Bari, but he quickly found that the city was virtually impenetrable. Otto's claim to the region of Apulia was that the region had been stolen by the Greeks, this is how he characterized the Byzantines, and needed to be integrated into the Kingdom of Italy. So Otto engaged in his own kind of Roman identity politics by saying that the Byzantine Empire was in fact not Roman, but rather Greek, because they spoke Greek, and they did not incorporate the original Italian territories that had made Rome what it was in the first place. So what we see here is that there is a battle for the Roman identity. Byzantium had been winning this battle throughout the Middle Ages up to this point, but now Otto was able to mount a fairly effective challenge of sorts to that claim. And now that he had their attention through his military deeds, he was ready to send an ambassador to try to negotiate and win over the concessions that he wanted. Around 967 or 968, Otto dispatched Lutprand of Cremona to Constantinople to negotiate a marriage between Otto II and Romanus II's daughter Anna, to negotiate about Otto's title, Emperor of the Romans, and his claim to the territory of Apulia. He also was tasked with gauging the emperor's attitude toward this aggression in South Italy. The plan seems to have been to offer to renounce the claim to Apulia in exchange for having the Byzantines acknowledge Otto's title, but this did not end up happening. In fact, Lutprand had an absolutely miserable experience that he describes in great detail, and he characterizes Nicephorus, Leo, and many members of their court in an entirely negative light. This is partly because he needed to explain or excuse the failure of his mission. I'm sure that he was not happy with the way that things went, but he also needed to explain to his master, Otto I, why he had failed, and there's no easier or better way to do that than to cast the blame on someone else. The Emperor Nicephorus and his brother were simply being unreasonable. Also, they are uncouth barbarians, and they were extremely rude. So that was Lutpran's way of defending his own honor and his reputation as a skillful ambassador. Let us now attempt to think like Nicephorus II, and like him, although we know there are problems in the West, we're just going to shift our attention to the East, because that is where opportunity lies. With the fall of Cilicia, the Byzantine penetration into Syria, and the death of Saif al-Dawla, who had for years been the Islamic world's chief champion in the region, there was a massive crisis of confidence in the Muslim world. This state of despair and despondency is perhaps reflected in some of the instances of anti-Christian violence in Muslim-controlled areas during the late 960s. In many cases, these come off as being impotent rage, where faithful Muslims come out and try to stand up for their faith in a mostly symbolic, but also very physical way. One example, the most notorious, is when Muslims in Jerusalem seized the Patriarch of Jerusalem and burned him alive in 966. That did nothing to arrest the tide of the Byzantine Empire, but it made them feel better. The point is, the situation was ideal for further Byzantine expansion, and this is why Nicephorus continued to place his primary focus on the East, even as problems continued to mount in the West. To the north of Cilicia, another great opportunity emerged, and Nicephorus was able to make a territorial acquisition for a very low cost. In 967 or 968, Asat III of the Armenian princedom of Taran died. His sons, rather than succeeding to their father's throne, offered instead to cede the realm to Nicephorus in exchange for official titles and command opportunities in the Byzantine army. At this time, Byzantium was expanding, 
at a relatively rapid pace, and it was clear that you would win more glory as a successful Byzantine general than you would as a prince of some really small realm that was more or less just a buffer state between Byzantium and the Muslim world. This family, now called the Taranatai, joined the military aristocracy in exchange for adding a territory stretching about 185 miles between Melitene and Lake Van. This was like adding another Crete to the inland of Asia Minor. This expansion enabled a punitive raid under Bardas Phokas the Younger, the nephew of Nicephorus and son of Leo, which resulted in the destruction of the city of Manzikert in 968. So this was an acquisition which had a fairly immediate impact as it enabled the Byzantines to strike deeper and harder than they had in the past. This would facilitate further deep operations in the future. In July 968, presumably fed up with being accused of murder due to stampedes at the Hippodrome, Nicephorus set out for what turned out to be his final campaign in the east. Petros, one of Nicephorus's eunuchs, was given command of the vanguard, and he was able to dispatch a force under Muhammad ibn Isa, which had raided into Cilicia. Nicephorus arrived in person after Muhammad's army had been destroyed, and he began to lay waste to territory in Syria. He passed by the city of Emesa and managed to extort the head of John the Baptist in exchange for his departure. This is probably one of the most interesting of the relics that he received. After a nine-day siege, Nicephorus was able to storm the city of Arca, and he was able to leave with a good amount of movable wealth. Later on, after seeing what had happened to Arca, the city of Laodicea surrendered by negotiation during this campaign and avoided a sack. After negotiating with Laodicea, it was time for Nicephorus to head back to Constantinople for the winter. Before he departed, however, he decided to make some positive steps toward the conquest of Syria and especially the capture of Antioch. He built a fort between Antioch and the Amanos Mountains, which would help to block the city off from supplies and make sure that it was right for the plucking when he came back the next year. The commander of this fort, Michael Bortzes, was left with a thousand infantry and 500 cavalry and he had strict orders against making an attempt on the city since he had such a small force and clearly could not seize a city the size of Antioch with such a small army. What was important is that he kept Antioch isolated and kept it growing weaker and more despondent. The main army of the east would remain in Cilicia under the command of Petros for the winter. Petros had proved himself to be capable, so he was retained in command and he would winter in 969 and await Nicephorus' return, presumably. For his part, Nicephorus returned to Constantinople, fully intending to come back to the east, or perhaps engage himself in the west if this crisis with the Rus and the Bulgarians grew worse. What Nicephorus didn't realize about Michael Bortzes, however, is that Michael Bortzes had a heart of iron and balls of steel. Despite his orders, Bortzes won over an Arab leader in Antioch and used his help to scale the walls and seize one of the city's towers. Because of his small numbers, Bortzes was not able to break out of the tower and take the whole city, and he found himself under siege by the Antiochenes. During this time, he was able to get a message to Petros with his main army in Cilicia, and Petros, despite his reservations at violating Nicephorus's direct instructions, decided to march to Bortzes' aid and try to take advantage of the situation. When the two combined forces, they were able to capture the city on October 28, 969. During the fighting, a fire broke out and some damage was done. However, the city had fallen in an unexpected and rather cheap fashion. Petros stayed behind to restore order and organize this new conquest, while Bortzes rushed back to the capital to defend his conduct and to give the good news in person to the emperor. It's not entirely clear what Bortzes thought Nicephorus would do given the circumstances. I imagine that Bortzes thought that Nicephorus would be willing to forgive his violation of orders and just look to the results. Maybe he thought that Nicephorus would even make him the new strategos of the theme of Syria. But that didn't happen. 
Rather than rewarding Vortzes, Nicephorus instead opted to relieve him of command. There is a most likely apocryphal story that Nicephorus was angry because a prophecy had once told him that he would die when Antioch fell. However, there's no evidence that Nicephorus was ever interested in horoscopes or astrology or anything of that nature. The more plausible explanation is that Nicephorus was a soldier emperor who had an emphasis on the soldierly side of the scale and that he expected his orders to be obeyed to the letter no matter what. Someone with his level of experience and success probably thought that he was the only person capable of making high-level judgments and that Vortzes had endangered the empire's security by his actions never mind that the risk had paid off. It's also possible that Nicephorus was feeling a little grumpier than usual because he learned right around the same time that his elderly father Bardos had finally passed away at around age 90. Perhaps had Nicephorus lived a little longer he would have rectified this mistake and given Bortzes another chance since he had proven himself to be a capable commander and someone who was willing to take risk on behalf of the empire. One of Nicephorus's last major decisions as emperor was to dispatch reinforcements to Italy. The failure of Lutprand of Cremona's um, embassy meant that the war continued and Otto I continued to make inroads into Byzantine territories. Nicephorus therefore sent a new commander, Eugenius, who would command the armies of both themes in Italy. This unified command had first been pioneered by Marianos Arguros in 956, and now it was so established as a plausible way to run things in Italy that it was given an official title, the Office of Catapano. Eugenius was able to turn the tide of the war and win some victories defensively as well as launch some raids into Otto's territory, but the war quickly turned into a stalemate as neither side was powerful enough to make any substantive territorial gains. When Nicephorus died, this war had become a stalemate and neither side had any real path to victory. On about December 10th or 11th of 969, John Zemiskis, Michael Bortzis, Leon Pedasmos, and other enemies of Nicephorus gathered together in order to kill him. Nicephorus had offended a number of high-ranking people through his actions, and there were others who simply saw an opportunity to rise in rank by eliminating an emperor who would never promote them. The conspirators had a pretty daring plan. They entered the palace grounds and made it to Nicephorus' bedchamber using some sort of a dangerous device that dangled them in a basket from the walls and they were on an unguarded face of the palace facing out to sea, and they were able to pull this off. For them to go to this kind of effort and risk in order to assassinate Nicephorus heavily implies that these men had quite a grudge. In the case of Zemiskis and Bortzes, we know exactly what their grudge was. They of course entered, they found Nicephorus laying on a rug, and they murdered him. Zemiskis was then able to seize power and set up his own reign, but that's a different story for a different time. For centuries afterward, the room where this notorious deed went down would be called Phocas's Chamber, and the deed became so notorious that guards were now posted on the palace walls to prevent a repeat performance at the expense of future emperors. Now that Nicephorus's life has ended, let's review one of the questions that are raised at the outset. Was Nicephorus a proto-crusader? Were his wars holy wars? Well, there's evidence in both directions, as I said, and the question is one that is rather hard to answer. On Crete 961, Nicephorus supposedly ordered all of the island's mosques burned, which then led to reprisals in Egypt where Muslims burned Christian churches. That incident by itself sounds pretty much like a holy war. What I would say is that some of the pieces that later characterized the Crusades were in place, but that the Byzantine Empire was fundamentally different than a crusading state. It was overland, steady territorial expansion. There was a plan, there were, was administration. Um, it wasn't driven necessarily by religious zeal. Religious zeal might get people through their days, 
it might sustain them in the face of hardship, but it didn't drive them to abandon their homes, march hundreds of miles, and try to set up a new state in the heart of enemy territory. I would have to say that Nicephorus is not quite a crusader. I think that he was not, he's not incompatible with the crusaders, but certainly he show, I think he was mostly a soldier emperor. If we really have to boil it down, we want to be fully correct. He is a conqueror in the tradition of previous Roman rulers like Trajan, as much as he is anything like a crusader. If we look at his strategy, he generally would soften up opposition and then expand into Muslim-held territory. His motives for doing so could be simply imperial, they could be Christian, or most likely they were both, with the emphasis being on the imperial part of it. Emperors were good when they expanded the empire. Nicephorus' obsession with relics is sometimes, I think, brought up as one of the examples of how much of a crusader he was. But that could be due to personal piety. It was a trend in the era. People were trying to create a new kind of uh, Byzantine triumph, which was Christian in nature. And it also was a way to gain prestige over the Macedonian emperors because they were too young to go out and win things in the name of Christianity or the empire. So again, um, just like many things, this is not something you can answer with a simple yes or no. And I think that the people who try to answer it with all the clarity in the world are probably oversimplifying it at best. And now for the part of the video that made me delay making this video for so long, Nicephorus's legacy. Where do we even begin? It's almost unfathomable how much he accomplished in just six and a half years. Yet, when I look at his record as a whole, I can't help but think, that Nicephorus II Phocas was both one of the most brilliant generals and emperors who ever lived, but also one of the most incompetent. He was both great and a failure. Two of his most significant deeds, the conquest of Crete and Cilicia, were mostly things that he accomplished before he took the purple. However, if we look at his body of work as a whole, including the time when he was a general, we see that he added a lot of land to the Byzantine Empire and that his gains were quite significant. He added Crete, Cilicia, Cyprus, and Tauran. He also broke the power of Saif, who died while he was in office. He broke the power of Antioch and ultimately seized it, although this was somewhat against his orders. Clearly, he would have pulled it off had uh, time gone on a little longer. So he was outstandingly successful in war, at least in the East. On the other hand, though, his focus on the East was singular. The situation in Italy was at best stabilized, whereas the situation in the Balkans went from peaceful and stable to the brink of one of the biggest crises that the Byzantine world would face. His nephew, John Zemiskis, had no idea what he was getting himself into when he murdered his uncle and took the throne. The Bulgarian crisis was about to erupt into one of the greatest wars that Byzantium would ever fight, and it would create a real rivalry between Byzantium and Bulgaria, which would massively eclipse the earlier rivalry under Crum and some of the other rulers of the previous century. Um, also, if we just look at Nicephorus as a politician, the level of ineptness that he achieved is truly astonishing. When it comes to domestic politics, whether it's keeping the people happy making sure that prices stay affordable, um, keeping the church happy, keeping the military aristocrats happy. Nicephorus was a flaming failure. He was absolutely terrible at the non-military aspects of being emperor. And he made no improvements over time. He seems to have not been willing to listen to critics and uh, he just persisted in the same behaviors and continued to lose support for it. When he died, no one had any sympathy for him, and very few people pined for the days of Nicephorus. But one of the most interesting aspects of his legacy is that his assassination is perhaps one of, if not the, best known assassinations in all of Byzantine history. It's the stuff of legend. You have this curmudgeonly middle-aged emperor living an ascetic life in the midst of a luxurious palace. He's sleeping on the floor on a rug with 
a really run-down shirt that he had inherited from his uncle. His nephew, who's this dashing, somewhat degenerate, but also daring, bold, brave guy, leads a pack of conspirators over a wall, through a window, and then into this bedchamber. They look in the bed. Nicephorus isn't there. They find him on the floor. They then stab him to death and seize power from there. And possibly his nephew was motivated by his interest in Nicephorus' beautiful wife, Theophano. It's an incredibly interesting story, and it involves all kinds of things that Nicephorus himself would not have understood. The idea of romance, for instance. The idea of this great risk to avenge an insult. All of these things seem to be foreign to Nicephorus' nature. He was very calculating, very focused. And ultimately his neglect of the human side of life, of the human side of politics, led to his downfall. As I said, when he died, no one mourned. But if you look at all of the great things that he accomplished with the Byzantine Empire, he should be remembered, certainly, even if he didn't do anything to endear himself to his people enough to be claimed to claim their love. He still did a lot for them in terms of making sure that the Byzantine Empire would be strong for decades and even centuries to come. And now for one of the more controversial of the Byzantine emperors, John I Zemiskis. Let's get the obvious out of the way. Zemiskis is best known for dramatically murdering his uncle and assuming power. This murder was committed in cold blood, and it is rather hard to overlook. That being said, Zemiskis went on to have a very successful five-year run of his own, and he did a great deal both before he came to power and after to advance Byzantine arms and the stability of the empire. It's really hard to gauge this man, however, and the runtime of this video should be a solid testament to that, especially when you consider that we actually don't know all that much about him when compared with, say, Nicephorus II, or much less, someone like Basil II. I think it's safe to say, however, that Zemiskis was one of the best emperors, even if he is not quite in that truly elite upper tier. And in his short five or so years on the throne, he came into power so late in 969 and died so early in 976 that I think we can really only count 970 to 975 as the years in which he meaningfully controlled the empire. During that short span of time, he still was able to make a major impact on the course of history. And had he lived and reigned a few more years, I think that his legacy would be far more solid. But, as always with emperors, we should begin at the beginning and look at his early life and all of the connections that he inherited, which later enabled him to become so very successful. We'll also be looking at his personality traits, which I think were absolutely key to his success, his military skills and accomplishments, and all of the other actions that he took in his lifetime. So, sit down, grab a beer, and let's talk about Zemiskis. John Zemiskis was born in 925, and unless he had actually been born into the purple, it is very difficult to imagine him being born into more favorable circumstances. He was from the creme de la creme of the Anatolian military aristocracy on both sides of his family. On his father's side, he was the great nephew of the great John Kirkawas. Around the time of his birth, John Kirkawas was still considered to be the greatest generational talent in the Byzantine world. He had really made himself into a legend of Byzantine history, and a lot of that prestige would then fall upon a young John Zemiskis. On the other hand, his mother's family was no less distinguished. His great-grandfather had been Nicephorus Phocas the Elder, the general who had distinguished himself greatly in Italy. His grandfather, Bardas Phocas, was not nearly as great of a general as Nicephorus had been. However, he was a fairly crafty politician who had made a friendship with Constantine VII. Constantine VII at this time was still living under the thumb of the usurper Romanus I, so this was something of an investment. However, this investment in Constantine VII would pay off by around 944-945, just in time to benefit John Zemiskis perfectly. But let's be clear, 
even if Bardos had never risen to the position of Domesticus of the East, Zemiskis could have claimed a high command at some point in his life just due to his paternal heritage. Likewise, had Kirkawas fallen into disgrace, it is possible that Zemiskis could have then sided with the Fokadis and still been able to achieve a high command. He was in a position where him not rising to some level of greatness was almost inconceivable. And this is even if he were to display a complete and total lack of talent. He was at the nexus of the Byzantine uh, military aristocracy. He was connected with everyone in that world who mattered. And again, it is nearly impossible to imagine him either being better connected or that he wouldn't be given ample opportunities to prove himself whether he deserved them or not. However, as we'll see, Zemiskis was quite an able man and he proved himself worthy of the opportunities that he received. Despite the fact that he was such a high-born nobleman and that his family is so famous on both sides, we actually know nothing about Zemiskis' father. We also don't know what the meaning of the surname Zemiskis is. It could refer to some place in the Armenian world, or it could be linguistically related to the Armenian words for red boot or for short. We know that Zemiskis was relatively short in stature, so it may be a reference to his height or perhaps the height of some ancestor who gave the family its name. By the time that his grandfather Bardos Fokas retired, around 955 or so, Zemiskis had about 10 years of military service under his belt, and he was considered sufficiently senior for his uncle Nicephorus to then entrust him with high command in his own right. So by the relatively young age of about 30, Zemiskis was now in a position to claim glory and live up to the names John Kirkawas and Nicephorus Phokas. When it came time for a young John Zemiskis to get married, he found an opportunity to entrench himself even deeper within the Byzantine military aristocracy. Zemiskis married Maria Sclerina, the daughter of Pantherius Sclerus, who was the leader of the powerful Sclerus family, yet another very well connected part of the Anatolian military aristocracy. The well-connected become yet more well-connected just by virtue of existing. Leo the Deacon tells us that Maria was both beautiful and wise, so she must have been a great partner for Zemiskis, who of course was an ambitious man who had some major worldly concerns. While the marriage was presumably rather happy, it ultimately was unsuccessful because Zemiskis did not produce an heir with Maria, and it seems that she died without them having conceived a son and heir for Zemiskis himself. We don't know exactly when they were married or exactly when Maria died, but we do know that by 969 Maria was dead, and a now 40-something Zemiskis was still without issue. Maria's brother Bardos Sclerus was later Zemiskis' most important political ally while he was on the throne. So while the marriage ended up not being technically successful, it was politically very successful and created a lifelong friendship between Bardos Sclerus and the future emperor John Zemiskis. Both Zemiskis' connections and military talent were major factors in his success. The way that they would contribute to his eventual rise to power is no mystery and needn't be explored too much further. There is an X factor, however, which put Zemiskis above the competition, and that was his winning personality. Unlike his uncle Nicephorus II, the people who knew and interacted with Zemiskis seem to have by and large come away with a very positive impression. We don't really have any personal abuse directed at him recorded in any of our sources. Zemiskis is universally described as being on the short side, but handsome and well built. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. It seems that women almost universally found Zemiskis to be an attractive man, and 
and when they would offer their bodies to him, he would almost always accept. Unlike his uncle Nicephorus, who was deeply ascetic, Zemiskis was the exact opposite. While he was not what we might call a party boy, he certainly could appreciate the finer things in life, and he enjoyed mistresses and wine when he could. The exact extent to which he indulged in these things is unclear, but because of the stark contrast with his uncle, who was more or less a warrior monk, we see Zemiskis as someone who was fairly lighthearted. However, it was this very willingness to engage in the pleasures of life, which ultimately made Zemiskis a much more talented ruler than his uncle. Nicephorus could be very off-putting and as we have seen and will see again, this had a lot to do with why he ended up losing his throne. Zemiskis, on the other hand, could be fun. He had a sense of humor. He could get along with people. People enjoyed being around him. Women wanted to sleep with him and wanted to be his friend. Uh, those are not things you could say about Nicephorus II Phocas, whatever else you may be able to say about him as a general. Simply put, Zemiskis had a talent that his uncle did not have, and that was the talent for politics. Sometimes when we look back at ancient and medieval rulers, we forget that they can't just claim to be the instrument of God or claim birthright. They actually have to interact with, lead, and inspire the people around them to gain and retain their positions. Zemiskis had the skill set required to be emperor, whereas his uncle Nicephorus did not. Under the new Domesticus of the East, Nicephorus Phocas, the order of the day was for coordinated assaults from multiple armies in order to outmaneuver and overwhelm Saif al-Dawla and his emirate of Aleppo. The idea is that if you have three different armies operating at once, Saif might be able to muster enough men to counter two of your armies, but the third one would be able to act unmolested. Zemiskis was entrusted with one of these three armies, the other two being commanded respectively by Leo, Nicephorus' younger brother, and Nicephorus himself. During this um, phase of the operation, and actually throughout the period of the cooperation between the three Focades, Zemiskis was usually entrusted with the command furthest to the east, and that means that although he was the youngest and least experienced, he was being entrusted with potentially the most dangerous command as he was something like the dangling flank of the Byzantine forces. In 956, Zemiskis was planning to assault the city of Amida when Saif al-Dawla drew him away by launching an invasion of Byzantine territory. Rather than pressing the siege at Amida, Zemiskis decided that the wisest course of action was to pursue Saif and try to cut him off in Byzantine lands, perhaps winning a decisive battle. So, rather than fully pursuing him, however, Zemiskis decided to settle down into an ambush. This is an idea which seems to have really been perfected by Leo Phocas, who pulled this off on a couple of different occasions, one before and one after this incident. Zemiskis, however, seems to have been a little less talented when it came to the ambush, either that or Saif had some forewarning. Saif managed to spring the ambush and break through, inflicting about 4,000 casualties on Zemiskis' army and seemingly wrecking it for the rest of the 956-57 campaigning season. To make up for their nephew's failure, Nicephorus and Leo marched in and managed to rectify the situation with their own armies, winning a few victories. And with Saif being worn down now after continuous pressure, Zemiskis was able to get his army back together, and he was in a good position to resume the offensive in 958. We can get a good sense for just how effective Nicephorus' grand strategy of using the three coordinated armies was by the fact that Zemiskis' 958 campaign will take place in northern Mesopotamia. In theory, the placement of the emirate at Aleppo, which was formally authorized by the Abbasid Caliphate, was to contain the Byzantines on the northern side of the Taurus Mountains and prevent them from penetrating into the heartland of the Islamic world. However, the strategy was clearly failing, even with Saif still in power, 
and still able to wield fairly considerable armies. This is also a pretty good indication of just how deeply decayed the Abbasid Caliphate had already become at this not all that late date. At any rate, in the spring of 958, Zemiskis would invade northern Mesopotamia, and it appears this move may have been somewhat unanticipated as he was able to capture the important fortress at Dara without meeting too much resistance. Dara had been strategically important for centuries back when Rome and the Sasanian Persians had shared a frontier in Mesopotamia. They had exchanged it many times, just like the city of Amida. Zemiskis was then challenged by Saif's general Naja, who brought 10,000 men from Syria in order to repel the invasion of Zemiskis and hopefully retake Dara. The two forces crashed near Amida, and here Zemiskis was able to inflict a heavy defeat upon Naja, destroying about half or so of his army, and thus rendering it incapable of further fighting. Naja presumably had to retreat to Syria. As for Zemiskis, his campaign was just getting started. He received heavy reinforcements from Basil Lacopinus, and then moved north against the city of Semisada. Perhaps his whole invasion of northern Mesopotamia was just to distract from his real intention. Semisada was a little closer to hand and more important at the moment. So far, it looked like the Aleppans were not going to try their luck again against this skilled general. Perhaps they thought that Semisada was a strong enough stronghold to hold out against even a Byzantine army with as many men as Zemiskis and Lacopinus clearly had. In 958, the same year that he had invaded northern Mesopotamia, defeated Naja, and captured Dara, Zemiskis then doubled back and made for Semisada. This is a strategically located city in southeastern Anatolia, which is along the banks of the northern Euphrates. This city had been a major target of Byzantine strategic interest since at least 859 when the first attempt to take it was made. Since then, Byzantine arms had been steadily gaining ground, and at this point, Byzantine reach had actually exceeded Semisada, but the city still remained a Muslim stronghold. That was a situation which was bound to change, at least if Nicephorus and his generals had anything to say about it. It was, of course, the Miskis who captured the city, and this seems to have been the victory which really made him politically significant. His other victories were still rather impressive, but by no means legendary. The capture of Samosata, however, represented an actual advancement of the frontier and a gain that the empire had been seeking for a very long time. The combination of the fall of Samosata, which was something of a thorn in the side of further Byzantine expansion, combined with Zemisky's proven ability to penetrate and operate in the area known as Al Jazeera, that being the combination of northern Syria, uh, northern Mesopotamia, a little bit of southern Turkey, was enough to convince Saif that the real threat among the armies was the somewhat dangling Zemiskis. So he decided to give his personal attention to the young general. The capture of Samosata was a done deal by the time that Saif arrived on the scene. In fact, Zemiskis had already moved on and captured the fortress of Raban. It was at that point that Saif challenged him to an open battle, and young Zemiskis was eager for a chance at revenge against the man who had beaten him a few years earlier. They fought a hard-fought, pitched battle where Saif's poet cousin Abu Faras was supposedly responsible for breaking two lances during the first charge. The fighting was so vigorous. In the end, however, Zemiskis and his Byzantine forces emerged victorious and managed to inflict some rather damaging losses on Saif's army. Many of Saif's inner circle, his court companions, were slain in battle, and he lost about 1,700 or so cavalrymen. These would be troops who would be very hard to replace, and perhaps this is why Saif's army was now so prone to defeat after this. Many of these men who were captured were later featured in Constantine VII's last triumph in 958. While this victory at Raban was not enough to break the power of the Emirate of Aleppo, it did inflict real damage, 
and we'll see that a couple years later when Leo destroys another army that Saif leads out that that victory would be more or less decisive. Had it not been for this victory first, then perhaps Leo's victory over Saif would not have been quite so fatal. I think it is something of a combination of Raban and then Leo's grand ambush in 960, which really did end Saif's power at Aleppo. In 959, Constantine VII died and he was succeeded by his son, Romanus II. During this time, 959 to 963, we don't really know very much about what Zemiskis was up to. We only have some rather vague notions, and he seems to have played something of a secondary role in the operations of this four-year reign. I assume he was left in charge of the east while his uncle Leo was sent west and Nicephorus was sent to capture Crete. However, when Nicephorus was on Crete, he took away many of the best units in the army, and this left the frontier armies dangerously denuded. It would appear that Zemiskis was left with the task of containing Saif, who would try to take advantage, and holding the line in general against any threats which may emerge. Saif took up the opportunity, and he was able to penetrate into Cappadocia before Leo, fresh off of a victory in the Balkans, arrived, and defeated him in another grand victory. This is the 960 victory I alluded to earlier, where Leo ambushed a plunder-laden army under um, Saif and almost completely destroyed it. What this implies is either that Zemiskis was tied down with obligations elsewhere, or else he had previously challenged Saif and been defeated. It's also possible that he was trying to lure Saif out of Cappadocia so he had raided into Saif's territory or something of that nature. At any rate, the real hero on the home front was definitely Leo, who achieved two victories, one in Europe and one in Anatolia, both of them within a very short period of time. The other great hero on the home front was Marianos Arguros. If anything, Zemiskis was at best a distant third, so he did not gain any distinction really during that period of time. We also know that as Nicephorus resumed his command as Domesticus of the East and tried to start softening up Cilicia, that Zemiskis once again would lead Eastern operations, but we don't know all that much about the details of what he did, and he didn't achieve any real signal successes during that period of time. When Romanus II died, he was still a young man in his 20s, and his two children were about five and three years old, respectively. This meant that he left behind a young widow, and both she and the boys would require a protector. Now, as an empire-wide hero, Nicephorus Phocas was a pretty obvious choice. However, the eunuch in charge of Constantinople at the time, Joseph Bringas, had other ideas. He thought that Nicephorus would threaten his own control of the government, and he began to seek for other candidates. I've argued in the past that his ideal candidate to serve as emperor was Marianos Arguros, a general who had served in Italy and then in the Balkans. One of the other people he approached, interestingly enough, probably just to undermine Nicephorus more so than to make a genuine offer, was John Zemiskis. He sent him a letter urging him to betray his uncle, take up the command of Domesticus of the East, and wait a while and then eventually he would receive the throne in his own right. Zemiskis may have been tempted by this offer. We know from later details that he clearly had some interest in this kind of power, but at this time he seems to have not thought the opportunity very appealing. Zemiskis immediately took the letter to his uncle Nicephorus. He didn't want to be accused of treason, so one way to do that is to come out up front and admit what had occurred in terms of the offer from Bringas. Nicephorus did not react the way that Zemiskis had hoped. He just seemed stunned and he wouldn't really speak or act for a long period of time. This seems to have really frustrated Zemiskis and another general who was there to no end, and they effectively demanded that Nicephorus act because they said that if he didn't act, someone would surely kill him and they might just go ahead and save him the trouble of awaiting death by killing him themselves if he was going to leave them hanging by not doing what he needed to do.
Of course, this is somewhat on the nose in light of what happened later. Nicephorus accordingly took up their advice and had his troops declare him emperor on July 3rd, 963. A mere, what's that, 900 years before the Battle of Gettysburg? To the day, at least the final day, take his charge. Fun fact. While his uncle competed with Bringas and Marianos Arguros for power in Constantinople, Zemiskis held down the east. After Nicephorus had been crowned, he officially confirmed that Zemiskis was to succeed him as Domesticus of the East. By the end of the year 963, however, both Nicephorus and Leo were back in the East commanding armies because the new emperor decided that he wanted to complete his project of conquering Cilicia in person. By the end of the year, all three Focates would be commanding troops and gearing up for a grand push on Cilicia. The first blow, which was a heavy blow, was struck by Zemiskis in December of 963. During one of his invasions, he was trying to capture the city of Adana when the Muslim cities in Cilicia formed a coalition force. Not only did Zemiskis win this battle, but he won it in overwhelming fashion. After routing the enemy, 5,000 or so of them took refuge on a nearby hill and they thought they were safe there and then could perhaps retreat by night. However, Zemiskis was able to successfully pursue them and then slaughtered them where they stood on the hill. This hill later became known as the Mountain of Blood. This, without a doubt, really broke the spirit of the Cilicians, and I would argue that this is the key event in the fall of Cilicia. After this point, the cities of Cilicia stood in no doubt about their chances against a Byzantine army in the field, and they would have also lost many of their best men on the field of battle. They were dependent upon the help of the Emir of Aleppo, the now elderly Saif, who arrived with an army too late. He had to come in a litter because he had already been crippled by a stroke. However, Saif was still dedicated to his job, but in this case, he was far too late to help his allies and he would never quite be able to restore the trust they had formerly held in him after the Mountain of Blood. 964 was more or less a year of minor operations, just dealing with Saif and then preparing for a grand push in the Cilicia. In the summer of 965, the three Focates decided to make the big plunge. In this invasion, they were focused on two major targets, the last two outstanding major Muslim strongholds of Mopsuestia and Tarsus. The governor of Tarsus, which was the larger of the two, requested terms. He knew that it was over and that there's no way that they and their ally Saif had any chance of holding back these Byzantine armies. However, Nicephorus was uninterested in coexisting with a Muslim governor. He declined the offer and decided that outright conquest was the way forward. Nicephorus accompanied Zemiskis, um, and the two of them went together to Mopsuestia. This ended up being a fairly tough fight, which required some extensive tunneling operations before the city fell on July 13th. The city was then subject to a fairly brutal sack. Afterwards, Zemiskis must have stayed behind with his men to gather things and settle affairs while Nicephorus led away some of the troops and joined Leo at Tarsus before the final assault there. Those were the last two major actions, although there were some minor actions later which completed the conquest of Cilicia. Late in 965, perhaps even after all three of the Focates had left the area, the final independent Muslim city fell to Byzantine forces and it was around this same time that Nicephorus celebrated a triumph at the capital. Meanwhile, however, Nicephorus decided, for reasons that are not entirely clear, to relieve Zemiskis of his command and send him home to his ancestral estate in Cappadocia. The charges that Nicephorus put against his nephew are far from clear. It seems possible that it was based on some sort of rumor, perhaps Zemiskis had been engaging in some kind of intrigue with the wrong people at Constantinople, or perhaps it was merely an unsubstantiated rumor. It's all unclear. We don't really know. 
And we also don't know, in light of later events, whether Nicephorus' suspicions were well-founded or just simple paranoia. It's possible that he noticed his nephew was much more popular than himself, and he feared that in the long run, being someone who was sonless, that Zemiskis might just simply usurp him, especially if Zemiskis continued to win the favor of the armies of the East. We know that Zemiskis had a manner which went over very well with soldiers as well. Whatever the reasons, though, Z uh, Zemiskis found himself sidelined, and for a while he was confined to the interior of Anatolia, unable to really do anything, perhaps under something like house arrest. By 969, it seems that Nicephorus' suspicions had lifted to some extent, and Zemiskis had won permission to travel as far as Chalcedon. Supposedly, according to some of the more scandalous sources, this was arranged by Theophano, the empress, who was having an affair with Zemiskis and wanted him across the Bosporus so that they would be able to visit one another. Most likely, though, it was simply a thawing out of relationships between uncle and nephew after several years where Zemiskis had behaved himself and not caused any problems for Nicephorus' throne. We don't really know what Zemiskis' feelings or intentions toward his uncle were back in 965. However, by 969, he had clearly developed a deep hatred of his uncle, and he was determined to be rid of him by any means necessary. It appears that plenty of other people in Constantinople felt the same way. These people included high government officials, fellow generals who had been removed from command and felt that it was undeserved, um, civil officials, people who worked in the church who were sick of Nicephorus' interference, and common people. The reasons for Nicephorus' unpopularity, to boil it down, were due to the combination of constant warfare, which required constant taxation. That would have been bad enough on its own, but most emperors were smart enough to realize that you have to keep up public morale at the capital by keeping the people entertained. Well, Nicephorus didn't seem to understand that or at least care about it, and he as someone who was very frugal personally, he assumed that others needed to act that way too, so he really cut back on public entertainments. This meant that all of the massive amounts of popularity he accrued early on in his career by capturing Crete and then Cilicia were completely and totally squandered by his failure to keep people entertained and yet keep milking them for money to build his own glory. He also for the elite was someone who they found exasperating on a personal level. He was humorless and he tended to be a very harsh critic of the people around him on a number of issues. So they simply didn't enjoy working with him and they were always afraid of being fired and exiled as it happened to Zemiskis, Michael Bortzis, despite the fact he had captured Antioch and many others. Now the sources allege that Theophano was also a major part of this plot and that she was eager to be rid of Nicephorus, who she found disgusting, and part of it was because she was in love with the much better looking Zemiskis and that this was all part of her plan to get a more attractive and more loving husband. But in reality, it would have been very foolish for her to have done anything of the sort because she already had someone who was clearly a rather dedicated and capable protector of the boy emperors Basil and Constantine. So if she did something like that for real, it would have been incredibly ill-advised and therefore is unlikely. We do know, however, that Zemiskis did have some pretty powerful allies who were involved. Basil Lycopinus, the illegitimate son of the late emperor Romanus Lycopinus and an uncle to the boy emperors, does not seem to have directly participated, but he was certainly privy to it and would join them almost immediately. The general Michael Bortzis rather fresh off of his dismissal after he captured Antioch against orders, was also furious with Nicephorus and thought that he had been deeply wronged. There were other generals present and officials, but I won't go into them because they don't really play that big of a role in later history. The arrangement was for uh, Zemiskis to cross the Bosporus, meet with these conspirators in the palace, and then for them to kill Nicephorus in the middle of the night before his bodyguards could react. The idea is that if they killed him before the bodyguards arrived, these guards would have no reason to retaliate, and they could simply establish Zemiskis as emperor and move on with their lives. <laughs> 
It's a pretty far-fetched plot in a lot of ways. It is somewhat Dr. Evil-esque in its complexity and also its contingency, but it worked. The assassination was planned for the night of December 10th. Unfortunately for the conspirators, especially Zemiskis, he was forced to endure a harrowing, unlit night journey across the Bosporus in a small boat. This could have very well ended up killing him if the boat had capsized and he had drowned. He was late getting there, and the conspirators were on the verge of panic when he arrived. However, he managed to restore heart in them, and they hauled each other up into the palace. In some versions of this, the Empress Theophano was busily hiding them away in rooms that were unused and keeping them away from even the servants. However, it's more likely that they found somebody inside the palace and they were all hauled up into a window or something of that nature. They then had to do some other complex maneuver to get into the wing of the palace that um, Nicephorus himself was in because, again, they had to move around very stealthily to avoid alerting the guards. When they arrived in Nicephorus' chamber, they at first panicked, again, because his bed was empty. They thought either he had found out about the plot somehow, or else he was out taking a stroll in the middle of the night, and he would soon come back with guards. But then they realized that he was just asleep on the floor on a rug, because as an ascetic, he thought that it was too soft and privileged for a sinner such as himself to be sleeping on a bed. So they then accosted him and woke him up, started slashing him, beating him up. He was thrown at Zemiskis' feet, and Zemiskis announced denounced his injustice and ingratitude, then kicking him while pulling out his hair and beard. This implies that Zemiskis was crying with rage and really just absolutely had developed a deep hatred of his uncle who he felt had betrayed him. So perhaps it is possible that he had once cared for his uncle up until four years ago, and that his sidelining had been a harsh enough experience to completely change his feelings. Ultimately, I suppose, ambition must outweigh family ties, at least for the elite. Basil, the uh, member of the Lycopinus family, that is, announced Nicephorus' death to the palace and then went out in the snowy streets and kept announcing it, hailing John Zemiskis along with the two boy emperors. When the Varangian Guard, which at this point was not really a battle unit, more or less just a bodyguard unit, arrived, they found the deed accomplished, and so, like the foreign bodyguards of many early Roman emperors, they simply decided that they needed a new job, so Zemiskis was as good as anyone in terms of uh, someone they could protect. As long as they got paid, and hopefully got a little bit of a bonus for transferring their loyalty, all was good and all was forgiven. As Anthony Caldellus commented in his recent book on this period, Zemisky showed the mind of a master politician in the aftermath of the assassination. He began immediately to act as an emperor by making and unmaking appointments to make sure that people loyal to himself were in positions of power. He also proclaimed himself alongside of Basil II and Constantine VIII so that he could appear as their protector and as someone who was working ultimately on their behalf rather than as a usurper in the traditional sense. In order to get a formal coronation, he had to engage in negotiations with Patriarch Polyuctus. Polyuctus, luckily, while he was somewhat stiff-necked and ascetic, was not really that huge of a fan of Nicephorus, so he was able to make some policy trades in order to get an arrangement that was acceptable. In exchange for canceling Nicephorus's episcopal appointments, which had again constituted interference that the patriarch and other prelates did not enjoy. Um, all that Zemiskis had to do otherwise was to find two minor conspirators and blame them for everything as if the whole assassination was their fault, not his. Obviously, he and his chief conspirators benefited the most, but it was the minor players who ended up getting executed. So, makes sense. I guess the idea is that it would be too impious to have an outright murder on the throne, at least in the eyes of Polyuctus who was going to perform the coronation. So this was sort of an official story to uh, expiate the sins of Zemiskis. Uh, 
He was also required to perform a kind of formal expiation by giving away his wealth, his personal wealth that is. He gave away half of his own private property to small farmers in Thrace who had been suffering. And then he used the other half to endow a house for lepers on the outskirts of Constantinople. There's some evidence that he may have genuinely been sorry that he killed his uncle. Either that or he was genuinely concerned for lepers since he actually did visit this house for lepers on several occasions and apparently was quite warm to the patients there. He was formally crowned in the Hagia Sophia and proclaimed by the army and people on December 25th, 969. Polyuctus himself crowned the new emperor and from this point forward, Zemiskis would act as the autocrat of the Byzantine world with full legitimacy and with surprisingly few challenges given exactly how he'd come to power. In November of 970, Zemiskis would further cement himself in the Byzantine order by marrying Romanus II's sister, Theodora. Theodora was not exactly what we would call attractive, however, she was known for her intelligence, and she did give um, Zemiskis a legitimate marriage into the Macedonian dynasty, which was far more important than having an attractive spouse if you are aspiring to hold the throne and retain your legitimacy. It was around this time, according to Anthony Caldellus, that Zemiskis most likely invented the idea that Theophano was responsible in order to create another scapegoat who would be a little more plausible than the two poor schmucks that he had thrown under the bus and executed in order to appease Polyuctus. But the story of Zemiskis' affair, Caldellus argues, actually originates from the period when the Fakadis revolted against Basil II in the 980s. So Zemiskis most likely would not have made himself out to be someone engaging in an adulterous affair against his uncle and then murdering him. Murdering him was bad enough on its own. So most likely this was invented later by a group of people who were also hostile to Zemiskis. This would also deepen the idea of Theophano as an evil seductress and plotter. Zemiskis though would not want to appear as someone who was easily pliable. And one sign of weakness in this period was if a man had a weakness for some woman who was then able to effectively tell him what to do. So very unlikely that Zemiskis would have spread any stories about his affair with Theophano, whether it was true or whether it never happened at all, which is more likely. A later vernacular poem captures the mood that this created and the image of Theophano, which has more or less endured to this day. In this poem, Theodora was able to capture the prize that Theophano had plotted for for years, while Theophano was led away into exile on a mule by, quote, the men with shriveled cocks and gaping assholes, which of course is just a derogatory way to refer to eunuchs who supposedly all engaged in homosexual acts because they had no testicles. At any rate, um, Theophano's name has been blackened, and I think that Caldellus and others who propose that a lot of it is just pure abuse in order to try to shift the blame away from Zemiskis and from other actors, that most likely Theophano was more or less just a puppet in this. And as I said, I don't think there's a very strong incentive for her to kill and overthrow Nicephorus given that he was the protector of her sons and that they were still not that close to manhood in 969. In December of 969, as part of his consolidation of power, Zemiskis had the Focades arrested and exiled. Leo Focas and one of his sons, Nicephorus, was sent to Lesbos, whereas um, Bardos Focas, the most talented of Leo's sons, was commanding troops in Anatolia. He was simply arrested and then imprisoned locally. As for appointments, Zemiskis obviously wanted to make sure that men loyal to himself were in positions of power, so he promoted Bardas Sclerus, his former brother-in-law, to the office of Stratolates, which simply means something like army leader, and then he either kept or appointed for the first time 
Basil Lecopinus as Periquimomenos, an office which would enable Basil to effectively run the finances and administration of the empire. For the most part, Zemisky seems to have been able to deputize to a much greater extent than his uncle had, and Basil will more or less run the government while Zemisky commands the armies and directs grand strategy. Early in 970 in February, the Patriarch Polyuctus died, so Zemiskis was able to choose his replacement, and he chose another ascetic but someone who was much friendlier to himself, Basil Scamandrinus, and this new Patriarch would remain in power for the rest of Zemiskis time as Emperor. Zemiskis planned to challenge the Rus, who had overrun Bulgaria late in the reign of Nicephorus II, but this plan would, of course, be derailed by a revolt that we'll get to that occurs in 971. In 970, Zemiskis probably wisely decided that he shouldn't leave Constantinople lest some intrigue arise and challenge his throne. Therefore, when the Rus led by Seviatoslav began to raid from Bulgaria into Byzantine Thrace, he decided that he would have to entrust his generals with the defense of the frontier. Peter Phokas, one of Nicephorus's nephews and a kinsman of the new emperor, was entrusted with the early defense of Thrace. Interestingly enough, Peter was a eunuch who was also the only member of the Phokades who hailed Zemiskis as emperor and worked for him. Peter was quite experienced. He had served in the east and fought with distinction. He was able to keep Thrace safe by using his personal bravery and his ability to avoid battle. His overall instructions from Zemiskis were to not engage the Rus in an outright battle. He followed those instructions. And in one minor encounter with the Magyars, he was able to kill the Magyar leader in personal combat. This seems to have somewhat demoralized the Magyar contingent of Seviatoslav's army, at least for the time being. After this humiliating setback and the cat and mouse game between himself and Peter Fokas, Seviatoslav became more eager than ever for a decisive battle, so he began to recruit more men by aligning himself even closer to the nobility among the Magyars, the Pechenegs, and even some of the Bulgarian boyars who he had recently conquered. This enabled him to raise a truly large army. Zenaris and John Skalitsis claim that the Rus were able to manage to raise about 300,000 men in total, but as modern scholars have pointed out, 50,000 is a much more plausible number, and it would be an army of 50,000 most likely that um, Zemiskis' generals would have to contend with. Meanwhile, Bardas Scleris the senior general under Zemiskis arrived and took command from Peter. Sclerus arrived with reinforcements and brought the troop total up to about 12,000 or so. This meant that while this was a relatively sizable army, they were still considerably outnumbered by the Rus and they would have to be quite careful. That being said, this was a very high quality Byzantine army full of veterans and with quality officers. So while they were outnumbered nearly five to one, they still were a force to be reckoned with. Bardas Sclerus knew that he would have to fight the enemy on conditions which were as favorable as possible. So his strategy was to feign fear of the enemy in order to lure them in and fight them on favorable grounds, and also to inspire overconfidence so that the enemy would make moves that he could take advantage of. Advancing towards Adrianople, Sclerus feigned something like panic and uh, dismay when he noticed the enemy numbers, and then he began to slowly retreat as if he were simply demoralized. It appears that Seviatoslav bought that Sclerus was simply scared and began to pursue rather vigorously. During this pursuit, Sclerus decided to engage in some minor skirmishing where he thought that the quality of his troops would ensure that they could whittle down the numbers and morale of this much larger pursuing force. Sclerus accordingly dispatched a cavalry unit under the patrician John Alakas in order to lure the enemy out and draw them into a trap. It was the Pechenegs who took the bait. 
and they chased Alakas into a shallow valley. The Byzantines managed to keep them uh, in chase by keeping the distance respectable enough that the Pechenegs thought they were on the verge of catching them. However, when they entered this valley, the Byzantine cavalry suddenly wheeled about and counterattacked, while additional ambushers emerged from the hillside and started to advance. This led to a slaughter of the Pechenegs, who were eliminated as an effective force in Seviatoslav's army. They also would come to hold a heavy grudge against Seviatoslav, who had not supported the Pechenegs, who had gone off in pursuit. So this would later come back to haunt Seviatoslav. Without knowing it, Bardas Scleris had actually really sown the seeds of Seviatoslav's demise with this small ambush action. A few days later, not far from Adrianople, the two armies squared off in an open battle at Arcadiopolis. Here, the battle would be very closely contested. Leo the Deacon and Skylitzes both claim that Bardos and his brother Constantine were forced to engage in personal combat and overcome enemy champions in order to keep their men going and ultimately win the day. It's worth noting, before we go any further, that Leo the Deacon knew Zemiskis and that they were friends. This also makes it highly likely that Leo the Deacon had a strong personal bias in favor of Bardos Scleris and most likely he also was friends with him. That being said, the battle clearly did go in favor of the Byzantines, and after a hard, long fight, it devolved into a slaughter of the Rus, which then forced Seviatoslav to fall back to his stronghold in Bulgaria. Back in Constantinople, the new emperor Zemiskis was mustering men from the eastern armies, stripping some of them a little bit thinner than might be ideal, and he was preparing to lead an invasion of Bulgaria the following year, where he would capitalize on the victories of Scleris and Peter Phokas. As you probably already know, this doesn't happen, because another event in the east will distract Zemiskis from making this invasion of Bulgaria a reality. As I mentioned before, Nicephorus II had no sons of his own, however his brother Leo did, and perhaps it was this potential succession dispute which led to the tension between Nicephorus II and Zemiskis in the first place. At any rate, um, Zemiskis had, of course, imprisoned and exiled Leo and his sons, and he thought that this problem was contained. However, and not surprisingly, it was the most talented of Leo's sons, Bardas, a man who inherited the skills of both his uncle Nicephorus and his father Leo, who would be the one to lead the revolt. Bardas escaped from his prison in Cappadocia and went to the army at Caesarea and started a revolt. Meanwhile, Leo and his other son Nicephorus were able to escape from Lesbos and they tried to enter in the Thrace and rally the troops there. However, they found themselves quickly captured and then handed over to authorities. News of this revolt prevented Zemiskis from mounting his invasion of Bulgaria in 971, and he would in fact spend the rest of the year in the capital just like he had the year before. This means once again he was forced to turn to his generals to deal with the problem while he remained at home. Unlike his late uncle Nicephorus, Zemiskis was a pretty big believer in diplomacy, and he decided to try to negotiate with Bardas Phokas after the capture of Leo and Bardas's brother. However, Bardas refused Zemiskis' offer of a pardon and the free use of his property, and instead began to march forward with several thousand men. I presume the hope of Bardos is that he could use his tactical talents in order to inflict a defeat upon the emperor and then make more men rally to his banners. Zemiskis, for his part, was a little too smart to take that risk, and instead he decided that Scleris should be the one to meet with Bardos and face him in battle. Zemiskis called off the invasion of Bulgaria and then sent Scleris with some of the best and most loyal men into Anatolia to come face to face with Bardas. Rather than fight Bardas head to head, it seems that he had quite a reputation as a formidable commander, 
Scleris instead disguised some of his agents as beggars and sent them into Bardos's camp, where they were in, they informed all the men that full pardons were being offered by the emperor, and that this would be a no harm, no foul situation, and they could all return to the normal ranks. For whatever reason, the men do not seem to have been that dedicated to Bardos, despite the fact that they had actually revolted for him just weeks before, and the army dwindled away over the course of perhaps a week. Bardos's following was then reduced to a few hundred men, and he took these men and holed up in a fort at Tyropoion. The revolt of Bardos Phokas showed that while the Phokas name did not carry the kind of weight that it had before Nicephorus's reign, it still commanded loyalty among many in the army. So Bardos Phokas and others were still very dangerous people to have about. Zemiskis at first seems to have been very angry with them and decided that they were a great threat, so he decided to execute Leo and Nicephorus, but then he decided to commute the sentence to mere blinding. And then upon further reflection, commuted it again to just renewed exile on Lesbos. At Tyro Poyon, presumably acting on behalf of his emperor, Sclerus laid siege and then convinced Bardos to surrender. He offered to spare the family of Bardos Phokas and his hardcore followers, terms that which were too generous for Bardos to refuse. Zemiskis then decided that Bardos and his family could go unmolested to the island of Chios. This is a fairly nice island in the Aegean, and it is not the worst place of exile one could imagine. Of course, those of you who are familiar with the reign of Basil II know that Bardos Phokas was not done quite yet. However, he will not reemerge from Chios until after the death of Zemiskis. Interestingly enough, it would appear that at least some of Bardos's descendants decided to stick around the island of Chios because in 1586, an Italian visitor to the island reported meeting Phokas family descendants who were living as peasants in one of the villages there. After the failed rebellion of Bardos Phokas, we hear of no further challenges to Zemiskis' authority. So his clemency was something which was worthy of Julius Caesar, and unlike Caesar's clemency, it actually paid off, and he did not end up getting murdered on the Ides of March. To say that Nicephorus II had engaged in anything resembling diplomacy, at least on a competent level, would be to very much stretch the meaning of the word diplomacy to the point where it means nothing. His nephew, Zemiskis, however, was much more adept at the art of negotiation, and he decided to use diplomacy in order to gain what he wanted in Italy, which was peace with the Western Emperor. Zemiskis, unlike many previous Byzantine emperors, was not against sending Byzantine princesses to marry foreign leaders. The woman he found to marry into the ruling house of the Empire of the West was his niece, Theophano. His niece was 16 at the time, and she was to be wed to the 17-year-old Otto, who would later become Otto II, then the heir apparent of the throne of the West. It was quite a good match for young Theophano, who of course had not been born into the purple. That being said, this was also a concern in the West, where many at court were at first outraged at how cheap Zemiskis had been by sending his own niece rather than some member of the Macedonian dynasty. However, for whatever reason, they changed their mind about young Theophano, and they decided that she was a perfectly acceptable choice. So she was eventually accepted and lived a rather happy life in the West, at least after the first few months of being shunned, uh, then she, of course, was accepted, became empress. Um, she married Otto II on April 14th, 1972. She later gave birth to Otto III, and his upbringing was more like that of a Greek than a Saxon because Theophano would maintain something of a private Greek-style court within the palace. And Otto III, pictured here, would go on to take the throne after his own father's death. So this was ultimately a very successful arrangement for all involved, 
and it shows that Zemiskis was someone who knew how to use diplomacy in order to achieve strategic ends where he didn't have enough military force to simply take what he wanted by arms. That is something that you need to be able to do to be a successful emperor, and it shows me that had um, Zemiskis ruled longer, he would have kept accomplishing more things, since unlike his uncle, he was not one-dimensional. Although he had lost all of 971 to Bardos Phokas' revolt, Zemiskis was confident of victory, and he had used his time well. In 971, while he was waiting at the capital for his grand campaign, he used his time to drill his Black Sea fleet and also make an alliance with Venice. This alliance would pay off in the short run because later on he'll find himself at odds once again with the Muslim powers in the east, and he will persuade Venice to also refuse to sell naval materials such as timber to any Muslim powers. As for Seviatoslav in Bulgaria, he does not seem to have used his time nearly so wisely as Zemiskis. We don't know exactly what he was trying to do. Presumably, he was trying to consolidate his hold on Bulgaria. We also know that he was clearly awaiting the attack of Zemiskis. So whatever his plan was is not entirely clear, and not to give too much of a spoiler, but it failed. Before leaving the city, Zemiskis decided to lead a long procession to the Hagia Sophia, where he paraded around with a gold frame fragment of the True Cross. Then he went to the port and saw off his fleet. They had their own operation to conduct. He would be marching on foot. So after that, he joined with his troops and they began to march out to meet with the Army of the Balkans. And from there, they would then march into Bulgaria. He started marching relatively early, probably in March, and as we'll see, it was not typical at this time to set out before Easter, so Zemiskis was actually getting a pretty good head start. When Zemiskis arrived at Adrianople to collect his army before setting out to the north, he found it slightly demoralized. This was due to the lackluster and lackadaisical conduct of his drunk cousin John Kirkawas. This John Kirkawas was not worthy of the name he bore, and he clearly was not on the same level of generalship as, say, Zemiskis or any of his other relatives. We don't know if John Kirkawas was dismissed for this failing or what happened to him, but we do know that Zemiskis did restore morale pretty quickly as the army began to march north into Bulgaria. Very luckily for Zemiskis, Seviatoslav had assumed that Zemiskis would remain at Constantinople long enough to celebrate Easter, so he accordingly had not taken the time and effort to plug up the passes into Bulgaria with small garrisons. And so Zemiskis found that his path into the heartland of Bulgaria was wide open, and he found passages that had been used by Constantine V and Nicephorus I in the past completely unguarded. He passed right through and emerged north of Preslov, or south of Preslov, excuse me, and he was holding the high ground over the Rus camp and the city. Now, because he held these advantages and he had the element of surprise with him, he decided that the time to strike was now. Once he arrived there, the Rus figured out what had happened and they hastily assembled to offer battle. The two forces engaged in battle at a river not far from Preslov. This battle raged on for a long time with great intensity, but there was no sign of either side gaining an upper hand after a long, hard slog. At just the right moment, as both sides were nearing exhaustion, Zemiskis unleashed his personal guard, and they were able to break the ruse. Then the Imperial Cavalry, which started out on higher ground, was able to sweep down and engage in a devastating pursuit all the way to the walls of Preslov, effectively wiping out the Rus army as an effective field force. So this shows that especially when you hold the high ground, if you achieve a rout, a cavalry pursuit can be absolutely devastating. Once Zemiskis arrived at the walls of Preslov, he was quickly able to storm the city. While a number of Rus had managed to make it inside of the walls, they were still disheartened and disorganized, 
and they had no way to break the momentum of the Byzantine army. However, once Zemiskis and his men penetrated the city walls themselves, they found that the citadel was still very hard to take because there were just enough roofs to hold on to it. Zemiskis, however, was undeterred. So in order to smoke out the garrison, he took apart some wooden houses, set them on fire, and forced the roofs to choose between being burned out and surrendered. The roofs chose their lives, and this also meant that they spared their hostages. Most of the hostages were Bulgarian boyars who were kept there to ensure the good behavior of the Bulgarians more broadly, but without a doubt, the VIPs among the hostages were Tsar Boris and his family. Zemiskis greeted his fellow monarch warmly enough and talked in the language of brotherhood. He said that he was there simply to liberate Bulgaria from the roofs and that he had no intentions of conquering Boris's kingdom. Whether Boris believed him or not is unclear. I imagine that the game was kind of exposed some when Zemiskis not only chose to celebrate Easter in Boris's capital, but also decided to rename the former uh, imperial city as Eonopolis, which is to say that he named it after himself in Greek. And after this, Zemiskis marched toward Dori Stolon, which was the last stronghold of Seviatoslav. His fleet was keeping Seviatoslav in check, and without the army that had been smashed earlier at Preslav, Seviatoslav was more or less stuck on the coast at Dori Stolon, trying to figure out how to escape from Bulgaria and the mess he'd created for himself in the area. The naval drills of 971 seem to have paid off. One has to imagine that Seviatoslav sent for his fleet and that they probably challenged the Byzantines at some point, but apparently to no effect. Either that or the Byzantine fleet was so efficient at preventing communications that the Rus fleet had no idea where Seviatoslav was. At any rate, Seviatoslav received no reinforcements, and he was more or less stranded on the coast of the Black Sea. This meant that Zemiskis was able to march in a relatively leisurely fashion to the coast in order to lay siege by land to the port city of Dori Stolon. Seviatoslav refused to yield, and also Zemiskis tried to mount an assault on the city, having succeeded in that in the recent past, but this attempt at a storm failed. Storms usually only work when a city is highly disorganized or taken by surprise. Dori Stolon, while the morale there probably wasn't super high, was at least somewhat organized, and the garrison was well established. So it was somewhat of a foolish attempt on Zemiski's part to attempt to storm such a city. Realizing that it would take a long time to starve out the Rus, Zemiski's on July 24th decided to use another um, age-old tactic of the Byzantine army, when he used a feign withdrawal to provoke a sally from the undisciplined Seviatoslav. This led to a very stiff battle, one in which um, Zemiskis eventually emerged victorious, and after suffering defeat in this way, Seviatoslav, who was beginning to run out of supplies, decided to surrender. The two monarchs had a face-to-face -face meeting, which was surprisingly friendly, and they discussed possibly restoring the old commercial treaty where members of the Rus were enabled to visit Constantinople in small groups. So this was restored, at least in theory, and the two departed more or less as friends, or at least two people who had something of an understanding. Seviatoslav seems to have been genuinely humbled by this defeat, and most likely he would not have troubled Zemiskis any further. The official terms of Seviatoslav's surrender were that he would evacuate all of Bulgaria, hand over all prisoners that he had, Bulgarian, Byzantine, or otherwise, and also promise to never attack the Byzantine colony at Cherson in the uh, Crimea. As for Seviatoslav, in return, not only did he receive the life of himself and his men, but he also was given food and then escorted to the Danube. Unfortunately for Seviatoslav, the seeds of his fate had already been sown a few years before. If you'll recall when um, Sclerus used Alakas' cavalry to draw out the Pechenegs and then butcher them in an ambush, this is something that the Pechenegs still were 
clinging on to as a source of bitterness. And they personally blamed Seviatoslav for the combination of their losses and the lack of spoils they had received from this campaign where they had contributed and lost so much. Apparently, Seviatoslav had not gotten to the point where he had started to pay off the Magyars and the Pechenegs with the spoils of war. So while Seviatoslav was trying to cross the Deniper River to get back to his homeland, the Pechenegs caught up to him and attacked him during the crossing, which resulted in the death of this Rus leader. Seviatoslav didn't just disappear, however, into the mist of history. Instead, his body was dismembered and his skull was turned into a drinking cup, a similar fate to what had happened to Nicephorus I back around 811. Zemiskis took his spoils and returned to Constantinople, where he celebrated another triumph. In this triumph, Tsar Boris and his family were on display, and it was clear that what Zemiskis was trying to demonstrate is that he had conquered Bulgaria. It's unclear, however, exactly how much of this Tsar Boris was let in on beforehand. When the procession ended, Zemiskis retired the Bulgarian regalia at the Hagia Sophia and declared that the annexation of Bulgaria would begin immediately and that it was now part of the Byzantine Empire. As for the now deposed Tsar Boris and his family, they were treated pretty hospitably. Boris was granted the rank of Magister and his younger brother was castrated for good measure to ensure that he wouldn't return to Bulgaria and try to launch a revolt. In addition, Zemiskis incorporated the Bulgarian church structure into the Byzantine uh, Orthodox structure. The Patriarch of Bulgaria as an office was abolished, and Bulgarian bishops were now told that they had to report to the Patriarch of Constantinople. One has to imagine that his new Patriarch was rather pleased with all of this, and thought that it had been a good idea to get on Zemiskis' good side since now his personal power had been enhance quite a bit. Zemiski's decision to annex all of Bulgaria was bold, but under the circumstances it made quite a bit of sense. Bulgaria at this time seemed to be a fairly weak kingdom, and leaving it that weak only meant that most likely Seviatoslav or some other person would sweep in and create a new and more vigorous threat on the borders of Byzantium. The temptation to expand to the north was far too tempting, and it's hard to blame Zemiskis for acting as he did. However, it seems that he didn't live long enough to really reconcile the conquered Bulgarians with Byzantine rule. It seems that the progress, such as it was in Bulgaria, was almost entirely made in the eastern third or so of the country that part of Bulgaria which faces the Black Sea and which is closest linked to the Byzantine world both geographically and economically. If we're looking at the western two-thirds of Bulgaria, however, we're talking about an area which could not reconcile itself with Byzantine rule. There was a lot of support for some kind of renewed Bulgarian leadership and people there were waiting for a champion to emerge. This would ultimately be the sort of catalyst and the um, fuel for a later Bulgarian empire to emerge from the ashes of the old. However, Zemiskis would not live long enough to see these problems bear fruit, as these would later become a problem for his successor years after Zemiskis was dead and buried. For the most part, the East had been relatively quiet during the first couple years of Zemisky's rule. This should come as no surprise since Saif of Aleppo had been long dead and the Abbasids were deep in decay. However, this changed to some extent when another major power arrived on the scene. This power was the Fatimid Caliphate. In 971, they arrived and started seizing territory in South Syria which then put them into contact with the Byzantine world, at least in the east. Of course, they already clashed with Byzantine forces in Sicily and Italy and had been at odds for quite some time on that theater. The Fatimids themselves were Shia Muslims of the Ismaili branch, and their rulers, while they were called caliphs, combined sacred and secular authority 
So they served as both imam and caliph. They were able to make religious proclamations as well as run the government and command the armies. The Fatimids, because of the differences in their religious views when compared to the Sunni Muslims who ran the caliphate, were hostile to the legitimacy claims of the Abbasid caliphs. This was important because it meant that there was very little chance of the Fatimids coming in as champions and becoming something like the new Saif on the scene. This also meant that it would be unlikely to see much cooperation between the Fatimids and Baghdad. For Byzantium, this was a pretty good thing. The real thing that held back the Fatimids and prevented them from really trying to threaten Byzantine power in Syria, however, is that there was a rival Ismaili group in the area called the Karmatians. The Karmatians had gained control of Arabia, and they, over the next several years, will challenge the Fatimids in Syria and Palestine on a pretty consistent basis. This will mean that the Fatimids will not be able to mount a major offensive against the Byzantines, despite wanting to. So what this does is it establishes something like a kind of um, standoff between the Fatimids and the Byzantines, where neither side has quite enough power to openly and meaningfully challenge the other, but the possibility is always there. While it is now apparent to us that the Fatimids would never really pose much of a threat to Byzantium, there was no way to know that, and based on past experience, the Byzantines assumed naturally that the Fatimids were a formidable foe. They had seen what they could do in Sicily and Italy, and they took the arrival of the Fatimids very seriously in the east. Accordingly, Zemiskis himself visited the east the same year that he had triumphed over Bulgaria. Late in 972, he arrived with his men and then invaded northern Mesopotamia. There, he was able to capture the city of Nisibis on October 12th and sack the city. He then moved north against the city of Myaferican, but he was not successful there. At one point, he also impressed upon the emir of Mosul the futility of resistance. So Abu Taglib, the emir of Mosul, agreed to pay an annual tribute. So this was not a brilliant campaign, but it was something that had some successes and it did show the continued weakness of the Abbasids even after a couple years to recover. When he returned home, he left the Domesticus Melius in command, and we're not really sure what Zemiskis did for the next few years, but he certainly was not campaigning in Mesopotamia. One of the most interesting facts about this campaign is that while Zemiskis was in northern Mesopotamia, the leaders of the Abbasid Caliphate tried to organize an army at Baghdad to oppose him, However, this effort led to a riot, and ultimately there was no attempt made to really stop Zemiskis. This implies that people were more or less not confident in the ability of the caliphate to deal with Zemiskis. Either that or it was a kind of draft riot of sorts where these men thought that they would just get eaten alive by the veteran Byzantine troops and that trying to raise an emergency army would only result in a complete and total slaughter. As I alluded to just now, and also as I mentioned at the outset, there actually are some considerable gaps in our knowledge about Zemiskis' life. One of those gaps comes in the middle of his reign. From late 972, after he withdrew from Mesopotamia, until the summer of 975, we don't really know where Zemiskis was at or what he was up to. We know that he was emperor, and that's about it. We do know, however, that his Damascus of the East kept up operations in Mesopotamia and Syria. Melius laid siege to Amida in early 973, but he was then defeated by the brother of the emir of Mosul in an ambush, and he was taken captive. A thousands of his men were killed at least, and their heads were sent to, ba to Baghdad for the caliph's inspection. As for Melius, he was taken to Mosul for safekeeping, and the intention seems to have been to exchange him in a prisoner exchange. However, he died in captivity early in 974, and he would never, of course, return home. Some of the sources claim that he was mistreated, but it is not clear that he was. 
And also it was not really customary to treat VIPs like senior commanders in that way. So most likely he was treated just fine, but he either died of injuries or some illness that people at the time had no way to really treat. Zemiskis probably arrived in the East to rectify this crisis created by Melius's defeat sometime in perhaps late 974 or maybe early 975. So um, this is probably the reason for his being in this theater in the first place, going into the summer of 975. In his book, Streams of Gold, Rivers of Blood, Anthony Caldellus posits that the campaign of 975 was designed to weaken Syria for a Cilicia-style annexation at a later date. The idea is that you go in, um, cause enough damage, and break up political organization enough that people just kind of give up hope and surrender. You then capture all of the relevant strongholds, install your own regimes, and do a little bit of colonization here and there, and you're good to go. I think that Caldellus was more or less correct, although I do disagree with him on the notion that because Syria was just too deep, this could never be done. Um, he also thinks that northern Mesopotamia could have never been conquered because it was so close to the Muslim heartland. But my counter would be to ask what political force was in place to actually prevent the Byzantines from doing this. So um, I do have a disagreement there with his account. Nonetheless, I very much do recommend his book to anyone listening right now. So the campaign of 975 was a pretty big success, but it's clear that it was the opening move in what was intended to be a larger project. The Fatimids in the south of Syria were very much weakened by Karmatian activity, so they posed no threat, and there was no real clash between the Byzantines and the Fatimids during this campaign, despite the fact that the emperor was in the field in person. However, the mobilization was large enough that it got the attention of the king of Armenia, Arshat III, who then raised a huge defense force in preparation for an invasion by Zemiskis. Zemiskis, who always was an adept diplomat, was able to convince him that, no, I'm actually going to Syria, I have no intention of harming Armenia, so Assad III gave up this um, intention of offensive action and instead actually sent some reinforcements to aid Zemiskis in his campaign. Now, there is a layer of myth which has attached itself to this campaign. Matthew of Edessa has an account written in the Crusade period which effectively turns this into a piece of propaganda designed to meet the needs of people living in the Crusader period. The idea is that Zemiskis was not just trying to expand the empire, but rather trying to liberate Christians at the Sea of Galilee and in Nazareth. That is totally false. We have no evidence he ever penetrated that far south. And also he was not waging anything like a religious war. If he was fighting Muslim powers and replacing them with Christian rulers, then this was more about just expanding the empire and putting loyal people in place and less about what we would think of today as a holy war. If Zemiskis was not trying to liberate the Christians around the Sea of Galilee, what was he doing? Well, so far as we can tell, he was more or less just softening up Syria and trying to deepen Byzantine control so that later on he could go for an outright conquest. During this time he fought no real notable battles, but more or less marched around unopposed and extracted tribute and then laid siege or ordered assaults as the opportunity presented itself. Zemiskis first went to the city of Baalbek and there he was actually challenged in the field for the first and only time by Alp Takin, a Turkish mercenary captain who had used his position of power to seize control of Damascus and establish himself as the ruler. Zemiskis was able to win this battle rather easily, and then he was able to turn and capture Baalbek on May 29th. This, of course, resulted in a sack, and this would have been where Zemiskis took away quite a bit of the wealth that he earned on this campaign. He then took his army to Damascus, and at this point, Alp Takin was pretty beaten, so he quickly agreed that he would simply pay off um, Zemiskis if he would simply depart. But because the city was kind of beaten up due to the um, 
not long ago seizure of power by Alp Token, and then this latest battlefield defeat, they were not able to pay the indemnity very easily, so Zemiskis had to tarry for a while waiting for the money to be collected. Eventually he did get his money, and then he left. His next move was to march to the coast, where he besieged Beirut. There he installed a garrison after he took the city. And while he was besieging Beirut, he also received an embassy from Sidon, which simply surrendered and offered him money. He then marched south and stormed the city of Byblos, where we get the word Bible, and also the Greek word Byblos, which gives us Spanish words like biblioteca, the root of things like book and library. Um, Zemiskis, however, then marched on to the city of Tripolis, which was held by a Fatimid garrison, and it was only here that his attempts to capture the city failed. After this, he marched back to Byzantine territory. By and large, a pretty successful campaign, even if there were no uh, world-shattering events during it. But if his plan was to break up um, this area of Syria and then annex it the way that Caldellus thinks that he was trying to do, um, then in this case it was a successful opening campaign, and undoubtedly had he persisted with the strategy, he had a very good chance of actually taking Syria and adding it to the empire the way that his uncle had conquered Cilicia and annexed it. On his return journey from Syria, Zemiskis fell gravely ill with some kind of a respiratory ailment. When he arrived at the capital, he was barely breathing. The Byzantine sources blame poison, and they name the poisoner as Basil Lycopinus, the eunuch who ran the bureaucracy. Supposedly, Zemiskis was deeply disturbed to see how many prosperous frontier estates were owned by Basil Lycopinus, and he resolved to do something about it when he got back to Constantinople. This supposedly panicked the eunuch Basil, and he accordingly sent his agents to poison the emperor so that he would not be put on trial, publicly humiliated, and then deprived of his hard-won um, estates. We don't really know um, John Zemisky's uh, health record, and of course we also have a two and a half year gap in our knowledge of his activities, so it's possible that he had some pre-existing health concerns which were then aggravated by the strains of the campaign in Syria and then the return journey. Most likely Basil Lycopinus did not engage in this act because he would have had very little to gain by it. He had been entrusted with more power by Zemiskis than any previous emperor, and things were not likely to get much better for Basil. Also, if Basil did act in this way, most likely it would have been in order to liberate his nephews rather than to punish Zemiskis, who had always done well by him. We have to remember, as always, that our sources are deeply, deeply biased against eunuchs, so um, anytime something happens, they will be blamed, regardless of whether it makes sense or not. What we do know is that John I Zemiskis died on January 10th or 11th of 976 at the age of 51. He accomplished quite a bit, and had he lived a few more years, he would have accomplished more. But here is where his story ends. The chapel that Zemiskis was buried at has not survived. However, we know where it was located, and we do have a pretty good idea of what the nearby local landmark would have looked like. Zemiskis took a small chapel near the Chalky Gate, which had originally been built by Romanus I, as a kind of private prayer area for the emperor, and then enhanced it, always intending for this to be his burial place. It's interesting the contrast the personalities of Romanus and Zemiskis. Romanus, this highly neurotic uh, and very religious guy who just wanted a private place to retreat to away from the public eye where he could weep over his sins, as compared with Zemiskis, who, while he had his uncle's blood on his hands, seems to have not really experienced too much guilt over it, and just wanted a really nice and unique burial place. This was a site that he selected by 972 at the latest. It was already under construction by the time that he set out on his Bulgarian campaign, and it was also the last place he stopped before he left the city that year. Interesting side fact. 
this would be his ultimate burial place. This is what the Chalky Gate most likely looked like during its prime. So around the time that Zemisky selected this as the site of his burial, this would have been what you would have seen outside of the tomb. Let's consider the legacy of John I Zemisky's. The first thing we have to mention is that he has heavy source bias in his favor and this is somewhat of a problem for trying to assess him fairly. The portrait that we get is almost overwhelmingly positive to the point where we have to wonder what he did wrong. Certainly he must have done something wrong and we just don't get a real portrait of that from the sources. I mean, unless you count the obvious assassination of Nicephorus. Zemiskis knew Leo the Deacon personally. The two of them seemed to have been friends, and even if they were not quite as close as we think they were, the fact is that Zemiskis could read what Leo wrote, so Leo had to be rather careful in his comments. Constantine Manasses was an admirer from a later period. He wrote under the aegis of Manuel I Comnenus, and he was a total Zemiskis fanboy. In general, the sources paint a rather rosy portrait, so we have to consider whether this was more or less accurate or whether it overrates the abilities and accomplishments of Zemiskis. I really don't know whether they were accurate or whether they were being too kind to the man. It's very hard to tell. And that is largely because of those gaps I mentioned where we don't know what he did under Romanus II. And we also don't have a very clear clue about what he was up to for the two and a half or so years between late 972 and the summer of 975. What we can say based on the available evidence is that Zemiskis had the total package required to become a truly great emperor. He was a good general. Now, he was not the best general of his age. He was not on the same tactical level as someone like his uncles, Nicephorus and Leo Phocas, but he was certainly very competent and he won a number of major victories. He seems to have been better at major set piece battles than he was at, say, ambush battles and using uh, terrain most effectively. That being said, um, you don't necessarily have to be the best general to be the best ruler. His other skills were actually more impressive. As we mentioned on several occasions, one thing that Zemiskis could do that his uncle Nicephorus never could was engage in diplomacy on an effective level. Zemiskis often used diplomacy to good effect. On several occasions, he managed to save himself a lot of headache by being an effective negotiator. He was also a great and natural politician. He was liked by the people around him. Clearly, that source bias that he had in his favor was because of his personality. He was able to win the approval of the people around him. This also means that he was good at becoming popular with the public. People did not miss Nicephorus after he was dead, which seems odd given that Nicephorus was a war hero, but they were happy enough to accept Zemiskis. He had grand ambitions for Byzantium, and unlike Nicephorus, who was always impatient, and imposing, Zemisky seems to have understood pacing to some extent. He knew that it would take some time to consolidate what he had gained in Bulgaria, so he seems to have taken a somewhat relaxed approach to his eastern ambitions. Had he lived longer, the campaign he started in Syria in 975 may very well have borne fruit in the form of the Byzantine annexation of Syria as a whole. As it stands, however, his early death meant that this was not likely to happen. So back to the elephant in the room. His usurpation and bloody murder of his uncle Nicephorus and then his ambiguous intentions toward Basil and Constantine are definitely marks against him. Um, people today tend to be horrified by the murder he committed and by the idea that had Zemiskis had his way, most likely Basil II, the Bulgar Slayer, would have been in a Constantine VII situation while Zemisky served as a latter-day Romanus I Lycopinus. That being said, just like with Romanus, we should not let the usurpation and disloyalty cloud our judgment about his abilities. John Zemisky was a great emperor. He had all of the skills and talents one could ever hope for in a ruler, especially a ruler at this time, and he spent his entire life toward expanding and improving the empire as a whole. 
given how Basil took some time to really get going as emperor, I think it's not unreasonable to speculate that had Zemiskis lived a few years longer and allowed Basil to mature just a few more years, that this would have been a more ideal um, situation for the Empire than having Basil come to the throne when he did, when he still needed to be more refined in order to really rule effectively. But we'll get to that when we get to that. For now, we're only talking about John Zemiskis. And I conclude that he was a great emperor, and he would have been one of the greatest had he just lived, say, five more years. Until next time, when we discuss the person who I get requests about all the time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and I will see you around.